Gabriel, good to have you. <laughs> good to have you. On Are the we show. starting? Yeah, this is. Oh, it. I love it. Great. I love that you brought a shrine with you, dude. I. This is fantastic. I'm a naughty boy. <laughs> And Our Lady has to keep a short leash on me because okay. loose lips sh sink ships, as they say. Mm, yeah, I've nearly been sunk by my own loose yes. lips multiple times. But it's really nice to have you. Thanks for having me. It's an honor to be here. I think the first time I ever saw you, you were giving a talk and it was on YouTube. And this must have been, I don't know, maybe 10 years ago even. And I just remember thinking that you were very much like Jason Everett. Do you know Jason? Yes, people used to tell me that you're like... The young Jason Everett, and then I would respond, he's like the old me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. But um, there's like a, you have this sort of stability, you seem to have, because I don't know you, you seem to have a sort of stability in your spiritual life that seems very constant in the kind of devotions you promote and talk about and engage in. And the two of you seem very devoted to Our Lady. It's a big compliment. I love yes. Jason Everett. He's a and, dear friend. And it, the thought came to me that you have to maintain the charism of the founder. He's not my founder in any way, shape or form, but he was influential in my life when I was in college. Was he? One with the chastity stuff, but what stood out to me the most from him was he was giving a talk to teens and he told them, my spiritual director, his spiritual director told him that to do a talk without first making a holy hour would be an act of pride. Mm. And so that for me stood out. I was like, oh my gosh, I better do a daily holy hour if I want to impact lives. And then he also wore the miraculous medal as a sign of his consecration mm -hmm. to Mary. So I wear the miraculous medal and people are like, hey, Gabe, you're the miraculous medal guy. Jason was the miraculous Is medal guy right? first. Yeah. So you were inspired by him. Yeah, for yeah, sure. Yeah, that's beautiful. The first time I ever met Jason Everett was in an adoration chapel because I flew to England. I was living in Ireland at the time and he was giving a big chastity yeah. talk. And he, you know, they do a holy hour every day. Yes. And then also visit the Blessed Sacrament right. before yes. he would talk just for a short amount of time. So that's funny that that's where I met him. What a great reputation. I met you in front of the Lord. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. So that's good. And then I've just been noticing your videos. They're so beautifully done. And I obviously saw the one you did with Tammy Peterson yes. recently. So yes. thanks for all the work that you're doing. It's, it's truly the fruit of the message. So I've got a message that I promote and... It has been the fruit from the very beginning, the very first time we hit record, just sitting in my car, to large-scale productions. Have you always been involved in uh, mm -hmm. production and no, cameras? No, not at all. Everything I learned, I learned watching YouTube. Okay. Yeah, I literally started out with a phone. And so Mother Angelica, as you know, she was very big on, if God is calling you to do something, do it, and he will provide the means after the fact sometimes. Mm -hmm. But so, yeah, we literally, I have no background in anything other than I got a degree in theology. So all the stuff that takes place in your channel, like the beautiful testimonials and all that, are you the main guy who's setting yes. up the lights So that's the, the crazy thing. People think that we have a production team. Yeah. It is literally just me. <laughs> uh -huh. I have an assistant. Okay. Like sh her position is literally assistant to youth ministry director. Okay. Like that is her full-time job. And she just helps me with editing. She helps me set stuff up. So like, this is like yeah. garage. Yeah, but we make it look polished. It. it does. It looks excellent. So Thank are you, you a youth minister then? then? Yes, youth minister full time. Okay. In Houston. In Houston. One of the biggest parishes in Sugarland. Okay. Yeah. And we've got a great, great community. Yeah. You, you probably know I got married there and lived there for a little bit. Yes. Yeah. I think, you, were you at St. Anthony of Padua in the Woodlands? She, or? my wife used yeah. to be there. I met her and when, and she was working at St. Thomas More. Mm. Oh, wonderful. You know oh, St. Yeah. Thomas More. Yeah. I don't know if you know any Hickman. Yes. Yes. The I know the Hickman. Yes. To, Wow, what a small yeah. world. Sometimes I go to adoration at St. Thomas More. Yeah. It's incredible. Golly, wonderful stuff. So how did you get into the faith? Are you, uh, I mean, you and I are the same age. Right. People will think I'm 10 years older, but that's not no, true. No, 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 You look great. Uh, <laughs> no, seriously. But um, you, how did you, I mean, my, my so conversion, I was 17, but what about? I was raised by my mom, single parent, only child. My mom did the best that she could, but she had to take two jobs. So most of my life, I was a latchkey child, which is you know, 50% of the country today. Mm -hmm. I was raised by MTV. Um, I was deeply impacted by a terrible television show called Sex in the 90s. Okay. And so it was giving me all of, because I, not having a father, not knowing anything about sexuality, not knowing anything about the meaning and the purpose of my life, it was saying sex, freedom, all these licentious activities. And so that was my mindset through high school. Um, fortunately, my mom did a good job in sheltering me and not giving me money or freedom to go to parties. So that kind of like closed me in a little bit and I did very good academically. Mm -hmm. And so I received a very large scholarship to go to the University of St. Thomas in Houston. Mm. And there, the philosophy and the intro to theology really opened my eyes to the truth of the Catholic faith. 
intellectually. So I was like, that's why concupiscence. I get it. That's why I'm so messed up. Yeah. That's why I make my mom cry. That's why I ruin all the relationships that I really care about. It's because I have a disordered inclination to do bad stuff. Mm. That makes so much sense. But I wasn't converted uh, in my heart. And so a lot of my classmates, I hung out with the best of the bad kids and the worst of the good kids. Mm -hmm. So they were like, not horrible, but they weren't good. They weren't good, but they weren't terrible. They were like doing drugs and alcohol and things like that. But that's what, you know, many college kids were doing. And they were going into the RCIA program to receive the sacrament of confirmation. And so I was like, these guys are barely Catholic and they're getting confirmed. I want to get what they're getting mm. because I, I believe this stuff intellectually. So I can do the same stuff and receive the sacraments. I had no. So you're in college. You hadn't yet been confirmed. No, I had not. Okay. So I made my first communion when I was in the eighth grade. Okay. And then after that, I never went back to church. Mm -hmm. It was just kind of like a formality, check the mm -hmm. box, you know, make my, my grandmother had passed away and she had mentioned that that was important to her before she died that I make first communion. But other than that, the only prayer I knew was like a superstitious prayer to St. Jude that all Mexicans seem to have. And my mom thinks, or she says that she's Mexican. Are you Mexican? Okay. Exactly. Yeah. So I don't know. Like I, <laughs> my skin is white. Uh -huh. My mom's skin is white, but she speaks in Spanish okay. and uh, answers the phone in Spanish. So I think she thinks we're Mexican. Is, Love you, mom. I mean, you're, are you're, is your grandparents from Mexico? Or? Our family tree is very shady. Okay. Every, everybody that I've ever met looks really white, uh -huh. except for my mom's sisters, which look very Mexican. I have no idea okay. what I am, to be okay. honest with you. I don't even want to do 23 and me because I don't know what's going to come out. Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I went on a retreat through the campus ministry and I didn't know anything about the Eucharist. I didn't know anything about Eucharistic adoration. And they're like, we're going to go do a holy hour with Jesus. And I'm like, all right, what do you mean by that? I don't want to look like an idiot. What are we going to be doing? He's like, we're just going to sit there and look at Jesus like, like a picture of Jesus. What are we looking at? No, the Eucharist. I was like, that little circle? Yeah, that's Jesus. I was like, no. Yeah, that's Jesus. I was like, so what do I do when I go in there? And th there was a philosophy professor. His name is Dr. Rebard. He said, you just go in there and repeat the holy name of Jesus. It's like, for an hour? It's like, yeah. So I went in there for about 10 minutes. I just repeat the holy name of Jesus, mm -hmm. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And then about 10 minutes in, a warmth came over me and I heard an interior voice say, my son, be quiet. And I was like, oh no. Jesus, 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 Jesus. He's like, stop talking. I was like, Jesus, Jesus. And in an instant, it was as if the finger of God touched my soul and my heart was like a rock and everything inside of my heart melted and I just started bawling and weeping. And this was before the passion came out mm. and I was having, so I didn't have this in my mind before. I was having what I didn't know was like a moment of mental prayer where I was visualizing scenes from the passion, Jesus looking at me in the face, telling me how much he loved me, how much I was loved. And I was just bawling for like 45 minutes straight, nonstop. Afterwards, people were like, are you okay? Like, is everything all right? Like that, it's not normal. Well, you're like sobbing, like yeah, hard. Like a little bit of crying like, would have been no, fine. This was like but... <laughs> ugly crying, like get this guy That's out of here. He's a distraction. And no. I, just, I just kept repeating. I was like, That's really Jesus. Like God is really there. Hmm. But, and so I became radically Eucharistic. Like I would spend every day in the church, but I didn't stop sinning. Like I was still, so I became a Eucharistic minister and I didn't know better at the time. I wouldn't do that now, but I was becoming a Eucharistic minister, giving out Holy Communion. And then I would go and commit public mortal sins like every night. Cause I was just like, I was living two different lives. And the campus minister, an amazing, amazing sister, she had previously given me a brown scapular because mm -hmm. she told me that I was on the highway to hell. And I was like, sister, is this how you start conversations? <laughs> She's like, when I see somebody who's on the highway to hell, sometimes I have to say hard things. Was well, she like, at St. Thomas More? Uh, St. Thomas St. Aquinas. University, yeah. She, she was one of the sisters there. Is it the one with the black veil thing? And yes, the, yes, yeah, yeah. yes. And the long brown yeah. simple habit with like a, a cross that's two nails. She came up to you and said you're on the highway to hell? Yes. How, she was how a, did she know She that? was a spicy sister <laughs> because they, like <laughs> she was spicy, but I loved it. I loved it. Because I mean, there, there was a like a talent show. And it was for campus ministry. And I went up and told a dirty joke during the talent show. Okay. And she was like super offended by this. Oh. And so 
when the, after I had this major conversion, she saw the changes in me. She saw that I was Eucharistic minister. Mm -hmm. She also saw that I was living a life that is not compatible with Catholicism. And it was around Lent and everybody in campus ministry was like, what are you giving up? What are you giving up? And I was like, I don't know. You know, I was like doing the typical chocolate yeah. soda thing. And she said, how about you give up sin, Gabriel? How about you stop <laughs> sinning mortally and publicly? That'd now, be a good- How did she know you were doing this? Because everybody knew. I was... Well, you were going to parties? And... I was going to parties. I was... It was just very okay. obvious. Okay. It was like I was... I had girlfriends. It was just very obvious. that I, I Public displays of affection. Yeah, yeah. Um, and did she say this to you in front of other people? I don't remember. I yeah. just remember her face in my face telling me, give up sin for yeah. Lent. Now, because of your pride, were you offended by that? Or did you feel loved? No, I was shocked. Shocked, yeah. I wasn't offended at all. Um... When somebody, she confronted me with the truth, but I had never thought about it. I thought that it was okay. It was really strange circumstance. So that day I said, I'm not going to sin for Lent. And I went home uh -huh. and it, if this was a cartoon, it would say two hours later. <laughs> <laughs> and I had looked at pornography and committed solitary sin within okay. two hours of making a very, very, very firm yeah. resolution yeah. that that's what I was going to do. Yeah. And so that night I recognized I have a problem. I've been sinning my entire life, not because I want to, like I, I really didn't want to. And I did, I have no control. Mm. And so I had a moment, I guess, of true contrition and I was in my room and I was crying like a hard cry and begging God for mercy. God have mercy on me. I'm a poor sinner. I'm a slave. I didn't mm. know that I was a slave. Help me. And when I said that in my prayer, I heard the exact same words repeated back to me audibly from a diabolical voice. And it was like, it was, it was a very high pitched screeching, mm. mocking, insulting. And, and I don't know where it came from, but immediately I said, St. John Vianney, pray for me. I have no idea where that came from. I had no devotion to St. John Vianney. Maybe I had heard about him somewhere, but it was like instinctual. The moment that that happened, voice goes away. Mm. So the next day I was afraid to go home because, you know, I, yeah. I, I audibly heard this. This was not a mistake. This was not an interior. This wasn't like, I felt guilty for sinning against the Lord. I did feel guilty the night before, but this was not, like I was not dreaming this up. So I went to campus ministry. I got a pamphlet on the rosary. Um, I went into my room. I'd never prayed the rosary by myself before at that point. I got on my bed and I just sat there and I was like op opening this packet. And I said, all right, how do you do this thing? I believe, so I believe. And the second that I said, I believe, a force grabbed me by the throat, pins me on the bed, holds me down. The room is like spinning in ice cold. I try to scream for help, but it's, I'm being choked. I could still breathe, but I couldn't communicate because I was trying to yell for my mom in the other room to come and help me. And I heard an interior voice say, I believe it's my guardian angel now looking back on it, pray. And so I was like, I couldn't pray. And he said, pray the Hail Mary. And I was like, ah. mm -hmm. I couldn't say the words. And finally the interior voice was like, and this all happened within like, it feels like an eternity, but it was like a 10 second, like lockdown, say it in your head. And so I got the words in my head, hail Mary. And internally, when I said those words, I felt like a, a release. And then, so I said it audibly, hail Mary. And the words Mary left my lips, the presence left the room. Mm -hmm. I came back to, and after that I was freaked out. And so I got on the internet and I typed in Google, you know, demon choking you, <laughs> pornography, oh, masturbation. You typing that in. Yeah. So, I, and thanks be to God, a website that doesn't exist anymore, which I wish it still did because it was very wow. helpful to me at the time called Padre Pio Center for Deliverance okay. came up and then they, they use the language of, do you have hooks in your life? Do you have intrinsically disordered things in your life that are entry points for the devil? And they listed out you know, bad movies, bad books, bad music, new age books, false God statues, mm -hmm. uh, pornography. All, they, they, they had a whole list of basically every possible mortal sin. Mm. Um, and I was like, yes, 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 yes. And then my mom at the time, she was very much into new age because she didn't have an authentic Catholic spirituality. So she had Buddha statues, African little like mm -hmm. faces, uh, elephants all over the house, which apparently she just likes elephants. That <laughs> night, she went to, I went to bed. I made a resolution. All that stuff is gone out of this house. So she went to work. I took everything, put it in a trash bag. I took her statues, smashed them in the front yard. 
um, it was not a pretty day when my mom arrived home the next day. That is powerful. Wow. Yeah, it changed me. I was never the same after that. I'm trying to think what I would do if something like that happened to me. I, yeah. I mean, did you speak to trusted friends or about it? And I talked to another sister. I, I think part of me would yeah. be afraid that I was overreacting or Im imagining it or just got sort of emotional and a sort of prayer experience. Of course, yeah. what no. you're describing is far like, beyond I did, yeah, it feeling was not emotional. Made up. And yeah. somebody tried to tell me, oh, you had sleep paralysis. I was like, I was standing straight up. And you, Something yeah. was holding me down trying to get in my chest. Yeah. And yeah. I said the name of Mary and I don't Amen. have a relationship with her. And it went away in an instant, yeah. like instantaneously. And so I told this sister, who's now I think deceased, God bless her, uh, Sister Madeline Grace about everything that had happened. She's very famous at the University of St. Thomas as not as like being strict, all these strict, good, holy women. Um, she's like, you did the right thing. She's like, you did the right thing. If I was living in your house, I would have burned and trashed all of those things. Uh, I was, she was like, just deal with the, the punishment. And, but then this is was the greatest blessing of my life. Like I, I don't say it out loud, but in a way the devil saved my soul because one, I saw that this is all real. Yeah. I saw the power of the Virgin Mary, the power of the Virgin Mary is so great that a mortal sinner, mm -hmm. uh, years of mortal sin. And I had had that demon of lust. I, I believe it was a demon of lust. I don't know for sure. I'd had that since I was probably in middle school and I had never known it. I'd never realized it. I thought that I was just doing what would make me happy. And with just saying the holy name of Mary, I was freed. And not only that, but I was given the opportunity to see that I was a slave and I needed help. Mm -hmm. And I had to, again, this website was very helpful because it said, if you're going from darkness to light, you must go completely all the way in, mm -hmm. into the light. Everything about you must be Christocentric, rooted in Christ. The music you listen to, the programs you watch, the art in your home, everything must belong to Christ or the devil will not leave you. Yeah. And so that started a journey of fighting against mortal sin. I ended up changing my major. I was doing very bad in my theology courses that were required. Like I think I took intro to sacred scripture three times because I failed twice or I got a D's in it. Mm. And then all of a sudden after that moment, all of my theology grades went from D's and F's mm. to hundreds. And the theology where before it was so foreign to me um, was like second nature, just all made sense, which yeah. the Catholic faith just makes sense. So I wouldn't even take notes in theology class anymore because it was, I was just absorbing it and it was making a huge impact on me. And the Lord through divine providence, he would put the best spiritual books that I needed at the time. Like I had no, I, I had no history in spiritual classics. Like I ran into the story of a soul by St. Therese. I ran into the life of Anthony by St. Athanasius. Mm -hmm. uh, one that was profoundly impacting was the practice of the presence of God yes. by Brother Lawrence, which yes. is like like the essence of all oh, it's holiness. Everything. I just reread it last it's, week. It's gold. Like, and I come back to that. I'm like, why do I ever make things so more complicated yes. than they really are? Um, so that, and then I came across the biography of Mother Angelica. Mm which was- Who in, wrote that one? By Raymond Durrell. Yes, it's excellent. Oh my I gosh. I read that- the audio book is oh, phenomenal. Oh, oh, Go download life, it. Life, yeah, it's worth. life hack, audio book that. It is really worth it. And people love Mother Angelica for the things that she provided on her program. I love her for the way she did it. Mm. I love her for the way she did it. So she provided for me a living concrete example of a person who's alive today, who acted in faith, who did not follow conventional wisdom, who saw Christ as a person who was journeying with her, asking her to make difficult decisions, and she did them. She did them even though it didn't make sense, even though the church was against her, even though her friends were against her, even though her mm -hmm. family was against her, and God provided because she thought she was doing God's will and God's not gonna lead anybody astray. That, I read that book like six times, but one chapter in particular really, really stood out to me because I love the University of St. Thomas. I love it. My my priestly professors, incredible. They formed me to think very, very powerfully. I've, I've got a very analytical mind. Great. But there's a chapter in that book where Mother Angelica is confronted by this priest who actually also lived in Houston for a time. His name is Father Robert de Grandis. He's very big in the charismatic renewal, very charismatic priest. And on a regular basis, he would pester Mother Angelica, kind of pray over you, Mother. And she would always say, no. I, I don't need the Holy Spirit. I was baptized. I mm -hmm. received the sacrament of confirmation. And so week after week, he would constantly come back and she would constantly say, no, no, no. But on one occasion, she said, if you will just leave me the you know what alone, 
and I let you pray over me. Can you just bug off? And so he said, oh yeah, I, pr- I just want to pray, mother. I just want to pray. And so he prayed over her and nothing happened. And a couple days later, she was in her room reading the gospel of John and a sister comes into the room. And when they say, mother, dinner's ready, she speaks in a foreign tongue hmm. and she can't stop speaking in a foreign tongue. So she just covers her mouth. And then from that day forward, there was a fire in her that although she was a faithful woman that she didn't have previously. And that when she read the scriptures and, and she's very famous for reading the scriptures in a way that the common man can uh, comprehend and feel mm. like if you're there from that day forward, her love for scripture, her zeal and her confidence in the Holy spirit was never the same. So I was like, I want that. I want that. I want a living faith. Cause no offense. Again, my, <clears throat> my priest, Nemo dot quote known habit. They, they teach you a lot of things. Like you cannot give what you do not have. They didn't have a fire and a spark that I was feeling like from the gospels Christ wanted. He said, I've come to set the world on fire and how I wish it was already blazing. You're going to do greater things in my name. And everywhere I was going, it felt like those things don't happen anymore. But in the life of mother Angelica, I saw that they were happening. So I wanted that. So I asked my friends, I was like, Hey, you guys want to go with me to the charismatic center? And they're like, heck no, dude, those people are possessed. Are you crazy? I hear they cast out demons over there and they don't even use the name of Jesus. They, they were acting like what I was suggesting was absurd and mad. Mm. So one night I got the courage to go to the charismatic center. Mm-hmm. And companions of the cross. The were companions they of the, the cross. Yeah. Yes. Yes. They're incredible. I'm, mm-hmm. I'm so glad we kind of run in the same circles. Yeah. So what I, what I witnessed there was people acting crazy. There was a man running up and down the aisles, praising the Lord. Mm. There was an old woman in a wheelchair, moving her wheelchair back and forth, (laughs) praising the Lord. Uh The homily lasted 45 minutes to an hour, but the priest was crying (laughs) and like on his heart was bleeding and he was begging people to repent of their sins and to come to Christ and, and just surrender your burdens right now and come forward. And so all, and they were like, put your hands in there. And I was like, and I'm not that kind of guy. So I was like, nope, not putting my hands up. Like, put your hands out. So I was like, not going to do it. You're not going to emotionally manipulate me. You guys look like idiots. <clears throat> but then the little voice inside my soul, my conscience was like, yeah, but don't they act like they have faith? Mm. Don't they act like the gospel is real, that the Holy Spirit is real, that God is real and he keeps his promises. And I was like, yes, fine. I'm not putting my hands out, but I'll open my heart a little bit to this. Cause I was like freaked out especially because all my friends were saying they're crazy. Yeah. So afterwards they were doing this, like praying over each other, a healing service. And I didn't have the courage to go up. And there was an older gentleman and he was walking out. And I like, I, I, I stared this guy down hard. I was like, like trying to stare a hole into his soul. And he, he felt it. Like I was just like staring him down and he's walking down the aisle and he's like, young man, is everything okay? I was like, no. He's like, what's wrong? I was like, I need you to pray over me so that I can receive the Holy Spirit. Ah. And as he was praying over me, I had an awareness. I have the Holy Spirit. I've had the Holy Spirit. I was baptized. I received Mm -hmm. the sacrament of confirmation. I'm in the state of grace. I have the Holy Spirit. I don't need this. But so that was my awareness then that God was wanting me to just give my entire life to him. Mm -hmm. And although I said to myself and I heard interiorly, you have the Holy Spirit. You've always had the Holy Spirit. You just didn't want it bad enough. I was different after that. That night I went home for better or for worse, mom, I'm sorry. I went home and I convicted my mom of all the sins that she had been committed, that she was away from the church for so long. How did you do that? And how did she receive it? Not well. Yeah. Nobody does. But did, no, but not, not just how did she receive it, but did you... Did you share well with love, do you think? Or? Uh, I was too zealous. Yeah, I've been there, man. But it worked. So I don't know if I was too zealous. Mm, so exactly. I, I, I convicted her and I said, I've been going to mass every day, every Sunday by myself. Mm-hmm. I went to Christmas mass all by myself. I went to Easter all by myself. You're the only person I have in my life. I need you to come to church with me. Mm. And so she'd start going to church. Later, I'm, I'm a very strong man. And we, there was a lot of butting of heads, but I will tell you, my mom is probably the holiest woman I've ever met today. I look at her and I'm so proud of her. Mm. She goes to daily adoration. She's like a rosary wow. warrior. She's, she fasts for me 48 hours straight, no, no food. She, she is a warrior. Mm-hmm. So I want to say I was too zealous. I could have been more loving, but I don't right, know yeah. that it would have worked. 
And I did that with a lot of people in my life and it worked. Yeah, I know it's it's a good point you bring up because I certainly in my early days of my conversion, I was extremely zealous. And if I could tell you a list of the yeah. things that would just sound crazy right. and which I wouldn't do today. But I think it might be even my pride that looks back and, and winces, kind of cringes right. at that. Whereas like, no, the Lord uses you in the moment with the amount of knowledge you have. And and so, yeah, I mean, I, I, I had similar experiences where I was proclaiming the gospel at parties, reading the gospel of Matthew to You're people. Not, That's crazy. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. But and so, as, so, so is it like, okay, have I learned more or have I become more of a coward? You know, right. sometimes we just look back on our early days of enthusiasm and we think, well, that wasn't so prudent. Right. It's like, well, maybe. Or, yeah, or maybe I'm making excuses right now. Yeah. I don't know. I think in the we, we do the best we can in Give the present moment and yeah. then our Lord brings yeah. good out of it. I was still struggling with mortal sin mm -hmm. and, and thanks be to God, there was a great priest at the University of St. Thomas. He's our, also passed. His name was Father Kelly. He looked like Jabba the Hutt, very large <laughs> man, very large. He could not stand or walk. And he oh. had a very booming voice. Mr. And he called me Mr. Garcia mm. instead of Castillo. Uh -huh. He said, Mr. Garcia, I want you to talk to me after class. And then I'd go and I'd go into his office. He's like, you need to go to confession. I said, excuse me? He's like, you're sinning and you're struggling with sin and I'm going to help you. And I said, all right. And so I confessed. I have looked at pornography. I've committed solitary sin this many times. He's like, the next time you do that sin, you come in here and you tell me. And I said, okay, yes, Father, I will. And he says, and for your penance, you're going to pray the Divine Mercy Chaplet and a rosary for the souls of those people that you're watching degrade themselves. Mm. And I said, all right, anything else? He's like, no. And then I went to confession with him every single day for like a year. Mm. I don't recommend people do that. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's a good idea. If people are struggling with pornography, I do not, because it can become a cycle. Yeah. I do not recommend people go to confession every day. Right. I do not. That's... I just wouldn't recommend it. This was a special case. He was giving me counseling. He was being a father to me, a father that I didn't have, um, showing me the mercy of God, the father, forgiving mm. me seven times, 70 times. Um, mm. And were you ever afraid as many people are that he'd just kind of get fed up with you? No, you not at all. You, this you, man you had the heart of a well. father. Yeah. Oh, he was so good. He was brutal and he was vicious. And he even <laughs> threatened one time to hit me in the private spot with a cane. He said, boy, if, <laughs> you, do it. if you don't get an A on this test, I, you're gonna be singing soprano. I was like, what? He's like, I'm gonna <laughs> rack you with my cane. All right. And what I found was that when I prayed the rosary, I had a special strength and temptation, although it existed, didn't impact me as much as it normally would. Mm. And so it took me personally praying four rosaries a day for me to stay out of mortal sin. Is this back in college? This is in college. Yeah. I never put two and two together. I never put like the idea of this is the, you know, the rosary is our lady presented to Dominic was the Psalter, the 150 mm -hmm. Psalms. I never put any of that together. It was just a period in my life where I recognized I don't want to sin anymore. Yeah. I'll do anything necessary. And if that means dying mm -hmm. four times a day to pray the rosary, so be it. I mean, absolutely. I mean, you think about the amount people endure for bodily health or fitness yes. or to look well, yes. the amount they put themselves yes. through. They get up at four in the morning, they have a cold shower, they work out at the gym. Yes. And, and so you exactly. become a Mary's athlete. And uh, we live in such a soft time where people will say, that's too difficult. And I love reading Teresa of Avila because she's like, the she's a doctor of prayer, but she's also like a tough woman. Mm. Teresa of Avila because she's like, the she's a doctor of prayer, but she's also like a tough woman. Mm. And she said, you find meditation difficult? you find it dry and boring, there's no way in God's green earth you would have made it at the crucifixion. Mm. You're called to be a follower of Christ and sometimes that means taking up your cross and following him to difficult places. And if you can't pray, if you're gonna quit on prayer, mm. are you a follower of Christ? Like these are her words and I'm like reading this, I'm like, whoa, sister, whoa, you're a tough woman. I discern, I, I try to discern my vocation to the best of my ability. I didn't, this is back in a time, this is like 2000, four, five, there aren't as many resources. Yeah. So I just would go to the blessed sacrament and surrender my life and say, Lord, what do you want from me? Do you want me to become a priest? I'll become a priest. Do you want yeah. me to become a teacher? I'll become a teacher. What do you want? And one day very clearly, I felt like he was saying, I want you to become a teacher. You have a spirituality that I want you to share with others. And I said, okay. And so I focused my degree track on theology and philosophy. And I said, Lord, I'll give you three years. 
Like I've got, I, I want to have a family. If I'm going to be a, a father, if you're not calling me to the priesthood, I need to be able to pay mm. bills and Catholic school education, except for very few churches, the wealthy parishes don't really pay the bills, especially I want to have a lot of kids if this is your, your plan for me. So I've, thanks be to God, got a job at the best, the wealthiest Catholic school in the Archdiocese of Galveston, Houston, the best top 1% in the entire world. And I was thoroughly disappointed in myself because I was ineffective as a teacher. Mm. I wasn't reaching them. I, my goal was, I'm going to share with you what got me so this out This is the high school you're saying this you're teaching school, it? Seventh, okay. uh, sixth through eighth grade, I right. taught. And so I thought I was going to go and I'm going to help these young kids to avoid the pitfalls that I had in high school. Yeah. I'm going to warn you. Yeah. I'm going to give you spiritual weapons and tools. And for the first year and a half, completely ineffective, mm. completely ineffective. And I, thanks be to God, I don't know how it happened. I do know how it happened, but it's a long story. I went on a retreat for a religious community from the Philippines whose priest was purported to have gifts of reading souls, working miracles. I don't want to say his name because he's not public right now. Mm. Um, and I went on this retreat and he was preaching a lot of things. This was around the time before Benedict XVI did the reform of the reform, started giving communion, kneeling down on the mm -hmm. tongue, et cetera. This priest who happened to also have been, I think a canon lawyer under uh, Ratzinger at the time, um, was saying at this retreat, very private retreat, don't receive communion on the hand for these reasons. And he gave all these specific reasons about the particles, about mm -hmm. uh, lex orandi, lex credendi, yes. how you pray impacts what you believe, impacts how you live, um, your union of a body and a soul united. So things I'd never heard before, uh, he said, receive Holy Communion kneeling down if you can, because your posture impacts your disposition. Right. And then I was like, well, I've got to go to confession because everything this guy is saying is true. And he was saying, you need to make a, telling the, the community there, you need to make a general confession. I want you to confess everything you've ever done that you can remember from the age of reason. And mm -hmm. so I prepared for like two hours, made a general confession, bawling the entire time. Because when you make a general confession, which you shouldn't do regularly, maybe like very few moments in your life, you look at every mortal sin you've ever committed. Mm. And so even if you've been going good for the past three or four years, mm. you look back at a lifetime of sin, a lifetime of breaking people's hearts, a lifetime of disappointment and failure, millions of times maybe, I don't know. Uh, I was in tears and bawling and the priest said, you know, you've hurt a lot of people. And I said, yes, Father, I know. He's like, and that's making you feel guilty, yes? And I said, yeah, I feel really guilty about it. He's like, do you wanna make up for it? I said, yes, I'll do anything. He said, for one year, pray the entire rosary every single day for 365 days. After that, don't look back. Mm. Offer this in reparation for all the people you've hurt. Ask Our Lady to bring good out of all the mistakes you've ever made and don't look back. So I was praying the rosary before, but then it became a lifestyle for me, mm -hmm. um, a rule of life. And I didn't know that, you know, how much discipline is needed to make this a rule of life. But then my teaching exploded. Really? My students became like saints. Literally, we, I have documented miracles that happened in the classroom where students were laying hands on other students who were deaf and heal, healing of deafness. All right, now you need to explain this. So <laughs> what happened? So I've got a lot of stories. Let's do the deaf one. Okay, so when I started praying the rosary more, I, when you're praying a lot, our lady begins to break through and speak to you. So she began to make my lesson plans. And she said to me, in my, again, this is all interior. I'm not having visions. This is all common to every man, the discernment of spirits. Mm -hmm. She was saying to me, what converted you? I was like, well, you did. <laughs> and uh, the Holy Spirit and how real he is and mm -hmm. treat the gospel like if it's real. And so she said, so you make the kids write out a list of surrender of their entire life, accepting the charismatic gifts as you believe that they are distributed and do that. And so I gave these kids a list of surrender, renouncing lies, accepting Christ, mm. denouncing the devil and all these things. And the most unsuspecting of all my students, the quiet kid in the corner that nobody pays attention to. And I, I'm embarrassed to say I didn't pay attention to him. I barely even knew his name. I know it now. He came up to me after adoration one day and he said, Mr. C. I was like, yes. He's like, Jesus told me to sing to him. I said, what? He's like, yeah. So I sung to him and I was like, what? And I was like, what did it sound like? And then he's like, you want me to do it right now? And so he was talking about speaking in tongues. Okay. I had a student whose mother worked in the school 
and she was partially deaf in one ear and losing hearing rapidly in the other ear. So she was like at 75%, no explanation, bones, some movement in the bone was closing off the hearing in her ears. Mm. I should also add that as I began to, to preach and teach uh, Our Lady's will, I began to have conflicts with administration. Um, the kids were wanting to go to confession weekly. Uh, the kids were wondering why they only offered confession at their school once a week. Why does father ask the kids to come to the altar to hold hands and sing? And so there was like, mm. there was some, why are all these eighth graders going up to communion with their arms crossed all of a sudden, like out of nowhere? So mm -hmm. there was, Catholic education in the United States at this point was not prepared for authentic Catholicism, like a rich living of the sacraments unleashing the lion that is the teachings of the Catholic Church in their fullness, the good, the bad, and the ugly. So there was a lot of fire going around mm -hmm. when this healing happened. And one of the, the student who was deaf, her mom worked at the school. And she had just told me at lunch that same day, my daughter says y'all are doing some charismatic weird things in the classroom. Do I don't want any of that stuff going on. So it was kind of like, oh dear Lord. But anyways, I'm not thinking that when this is happening. So yeah. this young boy comes up to me and he says, the Lord told me to sing to him. And I'm like, dude. To sing to who? The, to the blessed the, sacrament. He said, oh, okay, he was yeah. singing. Yeah, 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 the yeah. Lord told me to I'm sing to you. him in, in the chapel. Yep. And I was like, well, sing to me now. And then as he's saying that, this young woman comes into the classroom. And I said, stop, sing to her. And I said, and I'm not going to say her name, even though I think she went to Franciscan, actually. Uh, I said, yeah, come over here. He's going to sing to you. And so he's like, what do I do? I was like, I don't know, dude, put your hands out or something. Cause I don't seen this on the Trinity broadcasting network. Uh -huh. This is the only exposure I had to this other than the charismatic center. And so he like puts his hands out and then he's like, but then he like starts shaking and vibrating violently that he's holding the chair. He's like, Mr. C help me. And I said, dude, what? I'm, I'm like, not a teacher at this point. I'm like, what the heck is happening, man? He's like, I feel like electricity is flowing through me. <laughs> this is. Eighth grade, in between uh -huh. classes. This girl is like, her eyes are as big as like silver dollars. And the bell rings. I was like, dude, go to class. Afterwards, the young woman is sitting in the back. And I talked to her. I was like, <laughs> You're like I'm did, so did sorry. You, did you feel anything? <laughs> no. she, I was like, he said he was going to sing. I'm sorry. I don't know what he was doing. <laughs> if that was weird for you, I, I want to apologize. I was like, <laughs> please don't tell your I mother. Was just trying, I was just trying. <laughs> how did you interpret what just happened? Because I recognize now how imprudent it might have been. <laughs> Especially for me, yeah. academically. I might yeah. lose my job over this. Right. And so she's like, well, it was beautiful. I was like, what? She's like, the singing was so beautiful. I was like, I didn't hear any singing. And she's like, I did. It sounded like angels were singing. And I was like, wait a second. Can you go stand over there in the corner? To clarify, this is the deaf girl? This is the deaf girl. Okay. So I was like, can you go stand over there in the corner? And I'm going to say left or right. And I'm going to turn around. And you, uh, you and turn around. And you knew around. she was deaf at this. Yes, yeah. yes. Because I, I felt like she was going to be healed somehow. I didn't know how it was going to happen. I didn't mm. know if I had to lick my finger and stick my finger in her ear. Mm. Like, didn't I'm telling have you. To. I would. But no. <laughs> I, I, I thought about it. I'm telling you. I was like, the gospels are real. Let's see. <laughs> I'm not Jesus, but darn it, he is. And he can do this. And so I would be like, so she turned around. She would raise her right hand to left hand. I'd be like, left, 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 right, left, left. And this is across the room at the same volume that I'm speaking in. And then I was like, you should go see your mom. And then, and did she realize at this point that she got a hearing she, back? I or? think she was starting to freak out a little bit. This is right after class. She was in my homeroom at the end of the day. She walks down the hallway. She's all the way at the other end of the school in the same hallway. I turn around, I stick my head out the, the door and I say, I'm not going to say her name. I said her name and she turns around. I just said it in a low voice and she turns around and I said, you can hear. And then her mom heard this coming. She comes out of the classroom in tears. And she said, you healed my daughter. I said, I didn't touch your daughter. <laughs> Brandon did. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <What the reserves. laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And she said, you facilitated the healing of my daughter. I was like, that was all the Lord. And we had moments like this. So kids were having visions. One kid was saying that he was praying and, and he felt like a fire was burning up the school. And I was like, well, what did you interpret that as? That sounds pretty bad. <laughs> yeah, was, like, was that like a good right. thing or a bad thing? He's like, no, because people were worshiping God in this fire and okay. they were happy. And I was like, wow, this is incredible. But the administration, real quick. Yeah. Ear woman. 
Yes. That's what we're going to call her. And, and oh, let me tell you. So that was Friday. The next day she comes back. She had a medical exam on Monday. That's what I was going to ask. And the doctors claimed they have no idea how, but the bones moved back to where they were at originally. <laughs> oh, that's so cool, dude. Wow. Wild. So what, I mean, did this get around the school? Did mm -hmm. people hear about this? And yes. What about those who were sort of against... It was it, this weird charismatic I, stuff you were doing. How did they but respond? The thing, this is the thing is I was too charismatic for the traditionals and I was too traditional for the charismatics. Mm. I was doing both. And mm. I was telling the kids, I was teaching them, well, mm, yeah, you can receive to receive. Yeah, yeah. And I wasn't letting boys, I wasn't letting girls be altar servers. Yeah. I was saying, having the girls do the readings. I, I distributed to them chapel veils. I was talking about everything, uh, everything that's in the catechism that yeah. an eighth grader needs to know. And so although the miracles were great and we were having prayer sessions afterwards i got a message and this is all I, no offense but you can only blame the man at the top um it's just a different generation of priests good priests men who stepped up when nobody else was becoming a priest but they're just a generation of i don't want to say boomers um just a generation of men who are soft and aren't stepping up to be a sacrificial father for the sake of the sheep um and so the vice principal whom i loved and loves me her son became a priest. He had to come and say, father says you can't do this anymore. Mm. What, like what? Pray. I was like, you can't pray anymore? He's like, yeah, this is not a healing ministry. And I said, all right, we won't. And then more run-ins with father where they said, you can't talk. And I, I, I have the paperwork. I, I saved all the documents. You're not allowed to talk about mortal sin. You're not allowed to talk about purgatory. You're not allowed to talk about hell. You're not allowed to talk about human sexuality. You're not allowed to give out sacramentals. You're not allowed to X, Y, what, 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 what am I, what am I, is there anything I'm left to do? And you can say God is nice and he likes you. Right. And, and so it. they hired uh, a teacher to sit in my classroom because it was, it was, it was, the kids Wild. were loving it. They, the kids were loving it. The parents were loving it. The, it was it was just something. All right, so I, I can see there being an argument for why you might want to dial back the charismatic stuff. Yeah. Because that can get really weird really quickly. Right. Yeah. Uh, like all humans, especially when you bring emotion into right. it in any respect, it can get weird. So I, I guess I could see an argument for, especially if maybe there was weird stuff happening. There wasn't. No. There wasn't. By weird stuff, I don't mean inappropriate stuff. I just mean people getting carried away. No. No. We we're just praying over each other. Like the kids would, I wouldn't touch the kids. The kids would pray over each other and yeah. then they would, but, but that was really the low, like the charismatic stuff wasn't the bigger issue. So okay. like the promoting of the rosary, promoting of frequent confession. That was the thing. Yeah. So I got called in. So they, hi, they hired a woman to sit in my classroom whom I love and she converted. She started being more fervent, praying the rosary every day. It was, it was it was just God's providence. It was the Lord's will. The Lord was showing me everything. I say everything I learned about evangelization, I learned teaching middle school. Everything I learned was in middle school. So they put her in the class to sort of monitor you? To monitor me, yeah. That's got to be awkward for you. It was great. It was the best thing that could have ever happened to me. One of the best things. A lot of Why things. was it? Because I had somebody over my shoulder and I had to weigh everything that I said which yeah, yeah. was very stressful and left me very, very cynical afterwards mm. because this was my only, because I hadn't been Catholic before, so I didn't have a spiritual father at a parish. I did not grow up with priests yeah, around yeah. me. Yep. So it, it made me sad and depressed and dark feeling because I said, man, everything that Mother Angelica said about the church in the United States in the 60s and 70s yeah. was true. Yeah. Like these men don't, they're not, it, it, they're good. They stepped up, they're offering the sacraments when nobody else would. But there's more to be done, and they don't want to change to the establishment. They're very much like the Pharisees when Jesus showed up. I'm not. I'm not saying that. That I'm just saying when authentic Catholicism, like the true religion, shows up, and they just didn't want anything to do with it. And so they called me into the office, even though I love the principal, I love the vice principal, I love the the woman who was with me at that uh, throughout this time. We became such good friends. Um, they one of the questions he said is like, "Did you really say <laughs> that?" When you die, you're going to regret not having prayed the rosary every day? I said, yeah, absolutely. Because when you pray the rosary, you're saying, pray for me now and at the hour of my death. Think of the thousands of Hail Marys that are going to come to help you at that moment. Just one rosary a day. And he said, I would never say that. And I said, yeah, I wouldn't say that either. Well, and I, but and I told, we, we can go back and forth sure, about we, that if we, you want. Yeah, we'll talk about that later. Um, and then he said, you're gone. I said, because I, I, I respond, I was like, well, Father, maybe you should say that. Maybe yeah. you should be concerned with people's eternal salvation. Yeah. And he says, you don't have, a, I was going to offer you your job back, but you're done here. 
And so, mm. but it's not bad because if that didn't happen, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing right now. So when did that happen? This happened in 2009. Yeah. And so a lot of my students were converted deeply, deeply Praise the Lord, converted eh? and their parents because of it were also <clears> converted. <throat> and so they took their money out of the school and reached out to the neighboring pastor and said, this is what happened. We mm. will pay for him to work here for an entire year. So I came across these Steve Jobs videos and they were old Steve Jobs before he invented the iPhone, before he invented these you other say, things. You don't mean he's your actual friend. You, no, 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 I, I, I see. I have a problem. People that I think about a lot <laughs> or saints that I talk to a lot, sure. I will say they're my friend. That's okay. All right, so these videos from Steve Jobs. So one in particular, he said, when you recognize that the world is made up of people who are no smarter than you and no better than you, and that the way we do things for the most part is simply because somebody who wasn't as smart as you thought that that's the way you should do it. And when you recognize that and you realize that if you push in on the world, something's going to come out on the other end. If there's something you don't like, if there is a change that you want, if there's an end that you want, you have the ability to impact it mm -hmm. and change it. And at the same time, this worldly thought <clears throat> was entering my mind about the state of the church. Mm. And Benedict the 16th at that time, that's when he started giving out Holy Communion, kneeling down and on the tongue. That became something very passionate about mine. Mm. Um, Our Lady and the Rosary became very passionate for me. Um, and so I recognize that the number one way to make impact on the world is through the media, that the church has failed by and large to be in the media, to do it well, to make it free, just like the church of old in the Renaissance times. We're known for the most beautiful art, the most beautiful music in all of history came from Catholics. And now it seems as if too many people are afraid to be on the front lines, to use a technology that God has made available through good men or bad men, it doesn't matter. The technology is available. And so that um, led me to begin to dream about and pray about and discern. Again, all of this is the fruit of praying the rosary, mental clarity, mm -hmm. um, little tuggings on the heart. There, I came across uh, a film contest. I'd never made films before. There was a film contest called the Goodness Reigns Film Contest. It was to go to uh, World Youth Day in Spain in 2011. And they had a lot of money. People give a lot of money to a lot of things. Mm. You should give your money to Matt Frad and to myself <laughs> just because we're reaching a lot of people. You got to support good ministries. So I came across this contest that had a lot of money involved and they had various film categories, sacramental life, mm. moral life, all these categories. And so I had been a really big fan of St. John Bosco. His life was very miraculous and mm -hmm. mysterious. And so I had heard of a story about how he had been in the confessional and he had a line full of boys who hadn't been in the confessional and they weren't coming in to go to confession. And so John Bosco offers a prayer to the Lord, Lord, why are these boys not coming to confession? And the devil appears to him and says, well, there's three traps that I use to keep boys from coming to confession. And then he goes on to these traps or whatever, right? Mm. And so I was like, this would be a great short film. Yeah. This would be great. Because <laughs> I've got, you know, I've got a camera. It's a long story, but I, God help me. So when my wife and I got married, I told her that God was calling me to make movies. And she said, sounds great. You have no money. I said, if the Lord gives us six to $8,000, I'm going to use that to buy a film camera. And she said, great. If the Lord gives you six to $8,000, be my guest. <laughs> <laughs> so at our uh, reception, we're at the Double Tree Hotel. It's a yeah. very famous event. We call it the Double Tree event. Mm -hmm. Everybody got food poisoning. And the hotel offered me <laughs> specifically... $8,000. You're kidding. No, I'm not kidding. Hey, this is at your wedding, the reception? The wedding reception, yeah. Everyone got food poisoning except, at your reception? Except, yeah. Everybody was, had diarrhea and vomiting. Out of, they're, they're shooting out of both ends. I mean, how was your honeymoon? <laughs> we didn't have one. Yeah. We didn't have so one. Because my, well. my wife almost died. She, like, I found, I came home from school oh that day. Gosh, I was still working. You could have got so much more money. My wife, I love you. I'm sorry that Matt and I are talking about how much money we could have gotten if you died. <laughs> no, I don't mean that. I don't mean that. I mean, the fact that you nearly died. You I know, but my wife them. doesn't like suing people. No, I, I don't either. And I'm glad you got... So that's amazing. So how do they... <laughs> this is amazing. Dude, I'm telling you, this is like crazy story after crazy story. Ah. So I, I had $8,000. So I had a film how did camera. How did they write to you, call you? They called me because a lot of people went on the news and they're like, please... <laughs> 
Get out, don't go on the news. Protect us. Don't tell anybody. It's like, sure, I won't tell anybody. Next on Pints with Aquinas, Dave talks about getting <laughs> food poisoning. Right. <laughs> Just kidding. Yeah, no, eight grand is nothing. That's nothing. Yeah, I didn't know. I was a kid. Sure. And I spent $8,000 on a camera <laughs> in 2007, which the cameras aren't like All today. All the suffering of that diarrhea and vomiting got yeah. you the camera. But it's So wonderful. I had this film camera to do this film contest. Okay. And I'd never filmed anything with it besides family videos. And this is like one of these shoulder cams. Yeah. So I... I Win the contest, hands down, easy. I should say, oh gosh. So I made the kid's parents sign a waiver about film and photo. I said, okay, boys, this is what I'm doing. You go in there and you pretend like you're confessing. I'll pretend like I'm the priest and I'm pretending like I'm absolving you. I'm filming myself, etc." So I won the contest. Is I, this video online? Yeah. It's Can called, we intersplice it here? Please do. Yeah. All right. I'll, I'll send you the link. All right. And so I win the contest. My pastor calls me into the office and says, Gabriel, I saw that film you made. Next time, one, ask me. Two, please don't rub your hands all over the confessional screen. Because I don't, I, I don't know what the priest does on the other side. So I'm like, may God absolve in the name of the Father. And the Son. What a line. Please don't rub your hands all over the confessional I screen. I said, I know, Father, but mm. I asked. I'm sorry. I'm asking for mercy instead of per, uh, yeah, yeah. permission. Oh, yeah. S so I won the I won the the prize money. Now was, what about filming these boys in line? I had I had I had the waiver signed. Yeah, yeah. But did their parents get upset after that? No, but they didn't care. They were they were thankful. So Are you I proud went, of the film? How how long ago was that? Little um, short it's film? really good actually. I think that you could show it to a group of high school students today, yeah. and if they watch it, they'll go to confession. Wow. It's not so much the quality. It's and what do you have in these boys confess? No, Presumably they're just pretending. Not. They're just pretending. Oh, you don't hear them speaking. No, they, no, they don't, okay. no there's no words. <laughs> right. But I pretend to be the devil over their shoulder whispering, ah, okay, this yeah. and that, oh, murder, yeah, oh, all yeah, these yeah. just made up sins. Um, some of them boys might have committed. Um, <laughs> so I win the film contest. I win $4,000 because I need a new camera because technology- It's not food poisoning money, but it's no, not bad. No, it-, it because now the technology is with mirrorless cameras. So I see you're using mirrorless cameras. You know that the, the size is much smaller. The quality is mm -hmm, through the roof. Mm -hmm. And then the owner of the company, of the film contest company says, I know I promised you $4,000, but we really need you to come to Spain. And I said, not coming. I need the money. And she said, please, please just come to Spain. I was like, I'm taking the money. And she so said, that was like their alternative gift or yeah, something? Yeah, so you could either go to World Youth Day oh, I see. or you could take the $4,000 yeah, yeah, cash yeah. prize. Yeah, yeah. And I said, how about this? <laughs> I will go to Spain if you give me the money. And she said, fine, but can you do some films? Can you do some documentaries? And then maybe how to make videos, which I had no experience in making videos yeah. at this point. I just, yeah. This camera was totally automatic that I was using prior. Again, I have to reiterate, all of this is the fruit of praying the rosary. All these crazy ideas yeah. are the fruit of praying the rosary. I, I can take no credit. I am a bad, sinful boy from Houston, Texas with a single mom, not raised in the church. Mm -hmm. Like I have to reiterate this because it sounds crazy. So I go to Spain, go to World Youth. They absolutely hated it. I almost died. I, I, I will tell you a story that I almost died in Brazil at World Youth Day also, but no offense. God bless World Youth Day. It's wonderful. Everybody should go to World Youth Day. <laughs> however, however, I did not like it. It yeah. just seemed too many people. And they, oh, made no, it sound it's, like, it's they made it sound like you're going to see the Pope. What do you mean you almost died though? Well, we'll talk about, we'll talk about it in Brazil because I literally had a gun to my head in, in the Brazil World Youth Day. Okay. So I go to World Youth Day. I have a miserable time because it's hot. There's thousands, million, almost a million people mm -hmm. in a small town. There's no way on God's green earth you're going to see the Pope. I actually did get really close to him. It's a crazy long story. <laughs> I really did. I told them that I was the press. And so they gave me a press. They didn't want to give me a oh, press, press pass yeah. at first. But then I was just standing there and a guy was like, what are you doing here? I was like, prensa? And he's like, press? Photographer? I said, see, sí. he gave me a press pass. So I got to go on a bus. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So th th the reason I'm telling you this story. So on Sunday night, it was like five o'clock at night. I hadn't gone to mass yet. And the only church that had mass that evening was the church where St. Dominic was baptized. So I went to mass there. After mass, I was praying before a statue of the Virgin Mary. And take this with everything I tell you that I hear or discern, uh -huh. take it all with a grain of salt. Uh -huh. It doesn't matter. I heard interiorly, felt very strongly, a strong tug of St. Dominic saying, you must preach the rosary. You must promote the rosary. Yeah. And it was an understanding that I have tools available to me right now that were not available 
prior. We have the, we have the ability to touch souls all over the world. I must promote the rosary. Mm. I must study the rosary. I must study it. I need to know every word. I need to know the history of every mystery. I need to know the history of the rosary. I need to know everything about it. Because if this came from God, if this came from the mother of God, and she's promoted it at Lourdes, she promoted it at Fatima, she promoted it at Akita. Mm -hmm. if, she, if, if the church had said this happened and the mother of God left her throne and broke into human history, it's because it's perfect. And you need to convince people and convict people. And if you do, souls will be saved and yours will be saved in the process. This wasn't a long story that he told me. It was like an instant yeah. absorption, okay. a, a, an instant understanding. And it was so strong that I for, for a long time, I thought I was in front of a statue of St. Dominic. That It was so overwhelming that it was St. Dominic. Mm. Um, so I come back and I have my mission. I have my mission. And so I started making videos on the rosary, on Marian dev devotion and everything on my channel. I'll be very, very clear and, and transparent. Everything on my channel is to get you to love Mary and pray the rosary more. Mm -hmm. I'm posting people's testimonies. I'm posting lives of the saints only so that I will get more subscribers. So I know how to make videos that reach hundreds of thousands of people. I've done it. I, I can take an average person from the pews have them give their testimony. Nobody's ever heard of them. And that video get 200,000 views. I've seen some of them. Yeah, and, and they're just random people. Unbelievable. Random people. But that's not my goal. My goal is to get you to watch the videos on the rosary. And so the videos that I care about only get 20,000 views. Yeah. But, but that's what I love. That's why I'm doing this. Yes. So the more of those big videos I make, the larger the collection of people I that you. I can bring to the, no longer is it 20,000, maybe now it's 24,000 mm. or 25,000 or 26,000. So every video is only a stopgap to promote the Marian devotion. And it's, and it's not devotion, it's science. It's, it's science, it's, it's theology um, that marries the fastest, quickest, most effective means to Jesus Christ. Mm. And if you do what she wants, you'll do God's will in the easiest, best, most effective manner. And Quick questions yes, I please. want to throw at you because I know we hit have- Hit me, hit me. We Come have, on. I've been talking a lot. You need, to hit, you need to hit me. No, it's all been excellent. Uh, I, believe me, I'd be interrupting you if, if, if I was bored, but I'm not. It's fascinating, everything you're saying. But I know we have a lot of Protestant, good-willed men and women who watch this. So I've got a quick questions I want to throw at you and please. just have you answer them quickly. I'm going to hit you. Do Catholics worship Mary? Can I, can I give you the, the real problem? Okay. The problem is that they don't understand Christianity. They don't understand. Oh, wow, Mary. I was trying. I was trying. I was trying to give you a. a you no, know, I'm going to help complete, you. I'm helping them. And, I'm helping all right, them. Cool. They don't understand Christianity. Why um, did Christ come? He didn't come to save. Yes, he, yes. Okay, yes, he did come to save me from yeah, my sins. <laughs> yes, he did come so that I yes, can go to heaven. That's right. But to be honest with you, that's very shallow. Jesus came to make me like God. Mm -hmm. God became a man so that I could become like Christ. Mm -hmm. All the promises of the New Testament. Jesus says, you will do greater things than me. I have come to set the world on fire. I have to leave you so that the Holy Spirit will come upon you. And then you're going to do these things. You're going to have the life of God in you. The fathers say God became a man so that man can become like God. Mm -hmm. The essence of Christianity is that you become like Christ. We receive the Eucharist so that you become like Christ. You go to heaven because you are <clears> one <throat> with Christ. If that's, that is Christianity. That is Christianity, holiness, deification, mm -hmm. theosis. Mm -hmm. That is Christianity. When you understand Christianity, that Jesus isn't to shield me from the Father, mm -hmm. Jesus is to make me Christ, mm -hmm. and his will is so intimate, so personal, that he has a plan for every single individual, and he will reveal it to you in the moment, at every moment, if you so desire for him to do so. And when you do his will, it is no longer God who lives. It's no longer you who lives, but it is God who lives in you. If you simply did God's will, Jesus said, it's not those who say, you know, father, father, who are going to enter the kingdom of God, but only those who do the will of the heavenly father. And so Jesus's goal is for me to become like Christ. And so when you understand the goal is union with Christ, mm -hmm. holiness is union with Christ, then and only then do you understand Mary. The role of the Virgin Mary yesterday, today, and tomorrow is to make Christ. And so if I am yeah. one with Christ, right. if I am a member of the body of Christ, the mother of the head is the mother of the body. For me to love Mary is for me to become like Christ. For me to hate sin is for me to become like Christ. So if you have a problem with Mary, your problem is really about Christ's goal for Christianity. Because for me to say, Mary, you're my mother, is simply to be a member of the body of Christ. And the goal of the Virgin Mary is not to steal from Christ, is to make me like Christ. So by loving Mary, so there's three steps. I love Mary, makes me like Christ. I spend time with Mary, I begin to resemble my parent, 
just as Christ resembled his mother. And finally, her only desire is by the power of the Holy Spirit to form Christ in the womb. St. Augustine said that there is no saint in heaven that was not made a saint by the hands of the mother of God. She is absolutely Wait, essential. Do you know where he says that? Uh, to... St. Louis de Montfort quotes it in the book, okay. The Secret of Mary, and like oh. within the first 20 pages. Mm. Yes. And it's true. If if you're in heaven, if you're a saint, it's I just only... wonder if that's an accurate quote. Oh, it's, it's I don't know if it's from accurate. From Augustine. I don't know if it's accurate, but it's true. Yeah. And all, all the great no, saints I, agree. I, yeah. I, I'm with you. I, I agree that it's true. Yeah. And uh, sorry, sorry, Protestant friends, I didn't mean to no, hit you with a two by four. No, that's okay. And I'm sure a lot of them will appreciate your candidness. And yet I think they have, sure. from their background, from their right. sort of, they, they look at us and like, okay, you've been talking about Mary for the last hour now. Uh, right. It sounds like maybe you should be emphasizing Christ more. I'm telling yeah. you this because this is what all the comments say on all the I videos. Me, I, know. I, I can't get enough of this. I know, and I, but, I'm trying to change the trend. I'm trying to stop being sorry for my mother. On the defensive, amen. I'm sorry, yes. I'm, I'm not sorry good, for my mother. Good, I'm good. not. I'm not playing games. The problem yes. isn't us, the problem is you. Yes. You don't know what worship is, and you don't know what Christ is. Okay. What you do on Sunday might be praising the Lord, but it's not a sacrifice of worship. I appreciate that. I really like that. Yeah, that's good. We gotta be stronger, and, yeah. and we're gonna win. She's well, a mediatrix of every grace. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about that. I got yeah. I got Colbe right there. Will to love. Yeah, I love that. Guy. I love that man. But um, you know, I I always like when I talk about the Blessed Virgin Mary to begin with what De Montfort says at yes. the start of True Devotion to Mary. Tell me. Um, and I share this not for your benefit, no, no, but tell for me. those no, who I are want watching. I love him. He feeds me. Is that I don't? I, I think he's fine. Yeah. Uh, you know, how you have some saints. You're like, I know objectively you're sure. great. The problems with me, I just don't right. get you. Yes, I've he, got a lot of saints yeah, like that. Yeah. So he's kind of like that for me. But you know, he says that you know, Mary is less than an atom or nothing at all compared to he who is. Yes. So I like to begin with that. It's yes. like if I was talking to a Muslim and they misunderstood the Trinity and thought I worship three gods, yes. I would begin by explaining what I don't mean, what a I'm common not ground. saying. Yes. And once they believe me, when I say, no, yes. I'm not saying there's three gods, do you, have, you have to understand that. And they go, okay, I understand it. Then I can talk sort of effusively about yes. the Trinity, poetically about the Trinity. Yes. Likewise, when talking to a Protestant friend, I think it's important to realize we don't worship Mary. We right. don't think Mary's God. She's merely a creature. God, and this is the other thing Louis de Montfort says, has no absolute need of her. Right. Never, not yes. then, not Aquinas now. Aquinas says the same. Yeah. yeah. So now that if you agree that if you believe that I'm being honest, now let me speak effusively about yes. the Blessed Virgin Mary. So I think that's yes. I think that's important because I think a lot of Protestants are drawn to Our Lady. They're drawn yes. to the Rosary, drawn to Marian devotion, but they're a little nervous about it because they've been told yes. that attention to the Blessed Virgin Mary, devotion to the Blessed Virgin Mary, would somehow be offensive to Christ. Right. I always start all my major talks to Catholics as well, nailing down the true Jesus Christ. Like you got to start from Christ. His goal is to make you one with Him. And, and then I go through scripture, the book of Genesis, God, the father says to the serpent, I'm going to put a war. I'm going to put enmity between you and the mm -hmm. woman. He doesn't say between the serpent and the man. Mm -hmm. He specifically says the woman. Mm -hmm. And then if you go, and of course you all know this, you go to the book of John at the tree of life, the cross, it's the man and the woman. And then you go to the book of revelation, the dragon goes off to make war against the woman. Not against Christ directly. He attacks Christ. He attacks the mm -hmm. children of Mary through Mary. Yeah. If if we're honest, if we're not being, um, if we're not trying to like uphold our team's side of the of the opinion, and you're mm -hmm. being true to what Christ really wants. If if God loves me, He wants to give me everything. He wants to give me His body, blood, soul, and divinity. He wants to forgive me. He wants to give me infinite mercy. He wants to give me His complete presence, mm -hmm. and He loves me so much. He's going to give me His very own mother, and that this is the will of God the Father. And we see that at the wedding feast of Cana, where John says, there was a wedding feast of Cana and the mother of Jesus was there. Mm -hmm. He does not say there was a wedding feast of Cana and Jesus was there and Mary was also there. He says the mother of Jesus was there and Jesus was also there. Which happens on the seventh day right. in the book of John and the book of Genesis, it's a parallel. So, yeah. so it's it's all there. If people have the courage to, to scratch and they look at, Catholicism with unbiased eyes and without fear and without taking a look at the current state of the church, they will find God's church and they will find the great plan that God has for them to make them like God. Now, one thing I appreciate yeah. about the work that you do sure. is that you don't tend to get embroiled in ecclesial politics or Definitely what not. Pope Francis just said. Definitely not. I actually am open to people discussing these things. I am very open to it, uh, especially, I mean, it's hard to do well. 
But I think there's prob- there's way more people leaving the church today than there are joining the church today. Yes. And, and I think a lot of this has to do with the confusion around the liturgy with Pope Francis. Yes. yes with yes. weak bishops, with yes. heretical bishops, yes. bad people like me no. uh, who re- represent the church um, poorly. Um, and yet you don't, you don't get embroiled in that. And I, I want to, I'm oh. tempted, I'm tempted to, but I feel like my special calling is to bring everybody to Mary and Mary is the road that leads to the heart of God straight away. Right. And so if I were to comment on Pope Francis, <clears throat> on, you know, any, any of the current topics, I would unnecessarily close people off to Mary. Because they would say, I'm not listening to him because he's too trad. I'm not listening to him because he's too charismatic. Yeah. I'm not listening to him because he's against this person. I'm not listening to him because he's for this person. Right. Oh, he likes that program? I can't believe any good Catholic would like that program. So I'm very opinionated and I'm very strong, but I'm not going to do that on my channel, Mary's channel, because it's not my channel. I see. It's Mary's channel. And I can't, I can't, I can't die. So in the life of St. John Bosco, there's a, a story that at his judgment, he saw, I don't know how this may be a dream. He saw a large field of all the souls that he impacted. And then his guardian angel took him to another field and said, now look at all of these. And he said, who are these people? These are the ones you could have saved had you only had faith. And I don't want that to be my life where the Virgin Mary says to me, if you only Mm. kept your mouth shut, if you only didn't think that your opinion was so freaking important that you drove away my children. So I want to, I'm tempted to, I'm very opinionated as you know, Um, I just can't. And thanks be to God, she hasn't let me yet. Wow. But I'll tell you whatever you want to know. <laughs> <laughs> well, wow. Yeah, it's it's a wild time. I, here's what I've been realizing lately. Like you and I, same age, yes. right? So we grew up in the same church. I know yes. we had different times we came back to the church. But it's almost like Catholics who grew up under the pontificate of John Paul II, we have like a a memory of the church, yes. an understanding of the church that those who are coming into it don't have. It's It occurred to me recently, I'm, I'm, t- I'm teaching a class in Garming, Austria right now on love and responsibility. None of these students were alive oh when gosh. John Paul II was the Pope. And so a lot of them don't have the same affection that we have or interest we have. Just you saying his name makes my heart pump. I love him so much. I know? remember when he died, how it brought the world together. Mm. To watch him die gracefully, Oh my gosh, just the grace that was around my college campus at that time. So powerful. But I see, I I think that Pope Francis is a, a divisive Pope. Uh, I'll leave it at that. But I, I also think that I'm not sure what could bring us together now. It feels like Satan is sifting us like wheat, not just in the church, but in culture, in different religions. You see these, this conflict within groups within those religions. Things feel so divisive now that I, I think even if we had John Paul II elected to the throne today, you'd find a lot of the same. I don't think so. So I agree, but I disagree. So Our Lady has a plan. She's going to be the one that brings in Christ. If she has somebody, let's say let's say the, the next Pope mm-hmm. is a mama's boy, mm-hmm. and he prayed faithfully. Hopefully an African. Continue. I would love an African. <laughs> I've not met God. an African that Please I don't love. <laughs> yes. And let's say he was a mama's boy, yeah. and he prayed the rosary. Our lady's a master strategist. She has children all over the world that if this person, whoever this Pope might be, played his cards right, he could change the world. So because of technology, I'm going to be completely candid. I don't believe that there's any bishop or maybe, maybe Father Mike Schmitz is doing it. There's no bishop who's properly utilizing the media the way they should. If we had St. Peter or any of the apostles as our leader, they would be all over the internet. St. Paul would be all over the internet. He'd be making the best, like I should, my my bishop, mm. my Pope has the ability to talk to me directly. I don't need to hear from a third person party. He has the ability to speak right into my home and to the lives of my children. And if somebody did that effectively, if somebody was an effective communicator, I would turn it on and say, children, listen to this man. This is the leader of God's church. Yeah. They're not doing it. Uh, and maybe. I think I, I think he could do it. I mean, there I are some there are some people who are clearly called not to use the internet. I and I'm so thankful that many of them aren't. Uh, and I'm, faithful Catholics. Yeah, I, I'm thankful that many of them aren't. There's very few strong Catholic voices in well, the world. Well, who do you think's doing a decent job? I think Bishop Barron does an excellent I job. I think he does too. People yeah. give him a hard time. I yeah, love him. I love him. I too. think he's doing great. I think that they want him to be their savior, but he's not their well, bishop. Well, here's the thing. I also think that no one can be the answer to everything except our Lord. Right. And so 
your channel isn't right. going to appeal to certain people. Right. My channel is not going to appeal to right. certain people, and that's okay. We're all different right. organs in the body of right. Christ, even sure. online. But just because someone isn't the answer to everything doesn't mean they're not the answer to something. Yes, exactly. And that's what I love. That we, we talked about this before. Like, There's different members of the body of Christ. If you do what I'm God's the, will is for you, and I do what God's will is for me, I, I'm the kidneys. <laughs> <laughs> then together, we're going to yeah. do incredible things. Yeah. And I and I do be, I do believe that our late as sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. Our lady has her people in place. Mm. I really believe this. She's not going to lose. She's not a loser. She never loses. Amen. Our Lady of Victory is one of her titles. She does not lose. The difficulty is is that our heroes aren't going to look like what we imagine. Just like Christ didn't look like this grand general, victory to Our Lady looks like crucifixion. Mm. And so she has her children all over the world waiting for her right moment and she's going to strike and she's going to win. No Re doubt about it. Not to bring down the passion of bring this conversation. It. No, bring it. But it reminds me of uh, Princess Leia. Aren't you a little small to be a stormtrooper? I love it. Like that. The same way, the same way that uh, the hobbits took the, the yeah, ring to Mount yeah, Doom. Yeah, yeah. It wasn't the army outside the gate that won it. They were necessary. Yeah, no, I love it because I think uh, we often people who complain and I sometimes do about the failings of our leadership. Yes. It's not like that alleviates us of the responsibility to do what we're all called to do. You know, if it is the case that the Pope or the bishops or the priests or whoever you look to for spiritual guidance and are disappointed by right. is failing to proclaim what needs to be proclaimed, condemn what ought to be condemned. OK, well, they'll have to stand before God right. at judgment. Yes, of course. But that doesn't alleviate me. Right. Of proclaiming what needs to be proclaimed and yes. condemning what needs to be condemned. So 100%. in a way, it's like, well, not a lot is going to be different. Right. And maybe. this is why I am a big proponent of the rosary, mainly because every time we've had a situation like this in the world, the Virgin Mary said, pray the rosary, mm -hmm. that this will bring about the, the revolution first happens in one's own heart. When, when she appeared to Dominic, she said to him, in this type of warfare, the battering ram has been is now and forever will be the angelic salutation, the cornerstone of the New Testament. And mm -hmm. I like the word battering ram because Jesus said that the gates of hell shall not prevail. And you, and I'm sure you're aware that when he said that, he didn't mean that we were gonna hide and that hell won't break into the church. He is a very offensive individual. He's a winner, he's strong. He was talking very strongly that we are gonna break down the gates of hell where there's darkness, where there's sadness, where there's despair, by the power of the Holy Spirit, mm -hmm. one man, 12 men are going to break down the gates of hell. And so how does, how did Christ break into this hell that we live on earth? Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. It is always going to be those words that mm -hmm. bring down the power of the Holy Spirit that are going to bring about the reign of the sacred heart of Jesus here on earth. Because that's how it happened the first time. Love your passion. Yeah. Love how you talk about the rosary. Wouldn't ask you to change anything. I'm not. Good. Good. <laughs> Glad we're agreed on that. But I suppose he, here's maybe where Please. I might differ from sure. you and I get the sense that I'm not going to win this argument. I think it's important that we distinguish between what the church commands, oh, oh, encourages and forbids. Yes. Okay. The church doesn't command that Catholics Definitely pray the not. Holy Rosary Definitely every day, not. but your language makes it sound like she it is doing that. Now, again, let, yeah. me, let me finish because I'm glad that you're not nuancing what you're saying because the saints and, and I like be the very, great I champions of the rosary... Yeah did not nuance right. the rosary. They're sure. like, hey, well, technically the church doesn't command this. Yeah. You don't have to. They didn't do that. And right. I'm glad they spoke with the kind of yeah. passion that they did. And I'm glad that you're speaking with a with an analogous passion. And yet my fear is that when people gravitate to a particular devotion and it means a great deal to them, right. that they then talk as if this is essential in that right. sense of the definition and thereby place right. burdens on people that the church isn't. Right. And that might be the great scapula, the brown scapula, the divine mercy chapel. There's too many devotions. And if you look at every individual devotion in the West, there's a lot of promises that are usually right. associated with them. And the and those who were encouraging that particular devotion certainly didn't talk about that devotion as if it were optional. Right. And yet it is actually optional. 100%. Okay. So I'll be the so first one me. to say, So I, and I'm so thankful. This is why I love you. You're a great listener. Okay. Um, I'll be the first one to say it's not even a venial sin. It's not a sin or you, the mother of God is not, you, there's no, there is no mark against you for not praying the rosary. But if the church said that this happened, that the mother of God, you can believe this, that we, there's no theological error. It does appear that Our Lady did this and she worked these various signs. It is worth looking at what she suggested. And so this is where my mm -hmm. research came in. So if, if it's true that 
the rosary is from Our Lady, then the fruit one, the fruit should be true, and the ingredients that make it up should be true. And so the first ingredient that I experience when I pray the rosary is death. Like, I don't, I'll be, I'll be the first one to tell you, I do not like to pray the rosary. Is I, that still the case? I, I guess I, it comes and goes. But it comes and goes. I now see the rosary no longer as a burden. It used yeah. to be a big burden for about 10, 15 years of my life. It was a huge burden. And I would look at it and be like, oh, I got to get a rosary done. Um, but now I see it as my path to victory mm. because I recognize now what she's trying to do. She's trying to, to kill independent Gabe. So the, the selfish, <laughs> you know, if you Seinfeld reference. No, I didn't get it, but I like I like what you said. I didn't She's know. trying to kill independent Gabriel. Okay. Jesus said, unless you deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me, you cannot be my disciple. And so when I pray the rosary, 195% of the time, I don't want to. I don't. And when I say the Hail Marys, the angelic salutation, and I pray the Our Father, I'm saying mm. Holy Spirit inspired words that... I notice a difference by the time I'm done that when I'm driving on my way home from work and my initial instinct is to go home, give me some quiet time. Let me just veg out for like 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. I pray the rosary. By the time I get home, something happens inside of me that that selfish guy who only wants reasonable things, just give me some peace and quiet mm -hmm. for like 30 minutes. That guy dies mm. and I hear the voice of God. And by here, I mean a tugging on my heart saying, you know, who's also tired? your wife, you know, who needs you, your children. Mm -hmm. And so I go into that house and I say, here I am, Lord, mm -hmm. this mm -hmm. is my, this is me carrying my cross. And then it's just so brilliant because you're mixing the most fruitful words in human history, hail Mary, full of grace, our father with meditation on the life of Christ. We'll talk about this more, hopefully in a moment, about how to meditate well, using mental prayer, the way Teresa of Avila, mm -hmm. the way um, St. Alphonsus, the way St. Francis de Sales, the way Ignatius, all the greatest doctors of the church promoted to meditate in this one way that I just learned in the past year. That's why I no longer uh, see the rosary so much as a cross that I have to carry. Mm. Um, so the ingredients appear to me to be perfect. Their meditation on the life of Christ, there's a saying, a grace remembered is a grace renewed. By me meditating upon Mm -hmm. the Eucharist, meditating upon Pentecost on a regular basis, the graces of Pentecost, the fervor of the first discipleship is stirred up in me, but then also the fruit that I've seen. So I mentioned that I taught Catholic school and I'm still <clears throat> friends with many of those kids. I would say 70% of them left the Catholic church at my high school youth group. And we have one of the best high school youth groups in the entire city of Houston and Houston's amazing. So it's probably the best in all of Texas. Mm -hmm. And Texas is incredible, no offense, but it's probably the best in the entire United States. Okay. We have confession available every Sunday. <laughs> I don't have a dog in the fight not being yeah. from here, so, so I'll just agree with you. So I'll tell you why it's great. One, we have great speakers. We have confession available every single Sunday for an hour and 20 minutes for any kid who wants to go. The mm -hmm. lines are always to the wall. We have Eucharistic adoration every single Sunday. It's incredible. But even in that fertile environment where sacraments and the gospel is being proclaimed full-throatedly, I would say 70 to 80% of those kids do not keep the Catholic faith. The majority of my friends who have been to Catholic school, K through 12, in recent times, they would say out of 70 or 100 kids, five or 10 keep the Catholic faith. So it's not for lack of catechesis. What do you mean by keep the Catholic faith? Like, you mean you, intentionally like, live seek it, after like holiness? They, yeah. they, go to, they, they frequent the sacrament of confession right. and receive Holy Communion in the state of grace. Gotcha. Like have some objective hope to be in heaven yeah. if we're going by the church's objective standards. Yeah, 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 good. Um, but the 30% to 20% that keep it, like of my students that are really good, I ask them, do you guys pray at home as a family? And they say, yeah. I was like, what do you guys pray as a family? It's like, well, my mom and my dad make us pray the rosary. And I say, okay, uh, do you like it? And they say, no, not really. I was like, me neither, just checking. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Family rosary is very difficult for me. But I, so I do not, I do not, ever demand it or require it. But I will say I have seen hundreds, maybe a thousands of conversions and testimonials from people who have taken the rosary into their own life. And that was the breakthrough that they needed. And in, in it's partially that it's a regimen. So I'm friends with Father Ripperger. He says that he puts people who have diabolical obsessions on a protocol that requires morning prayer, 6 a.m., prayer at noon, prayer in the mm. evening, very regimented because it builds discipline. Yeah. So partially because to pray the rosary like that requires a great discipline. It does, yeah. But on top of that, you're invoking the mother of God. On top of that, that's the spouse of the Holy Spirit. You're invoking the mediatrix of all mm -hmm. grace. You're spending your entire day 
uh, with Christ yeah. in mental prayer. Yeah. So it's not required, but it's darn fruitful. Yeah. 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 If when you look at the saints and their great love yeah. and promotion of the rosary, I think humility requires that we go, okay, maybe right. I don't get it, but maybe that doesn't matter. So I'll, I'll give you a quick witness from my own son. So when he was in about- How many kids do you have? I have four. So Excellent. I have a 15 year old, um, a 12 year old, a six year old, and a two and a half year old. Oh, fantastic. So I don't, I don't, I, the only prayer that I force upon my high school students is when we do rosary as a group on our retreats or on the bus. Mm -hmm. And upon my family, we pray a daily rosary. Mm -hmm. um, they, I don't like it. I'll be completely honest with you. I don't like it. They don't like it. Can I have you expand upon that? And the yeah. reason I ask that is because I think a lot of people listening go, well, I don't really like it either, but right. I got a feeling that I, I don't believe you when you say you don't like it. Me. So help, help yeah. me understand just very plain, boring, psychological. Is it just like, and then let me come back to my son after. Okay. Okay. Sure. Yeah. Cause his testimony is very important to me. Sure. So when I'm at home, and I've begun to relax. It is human nature to mm. want to continue to relax, yeah. to call together my, to, to be to, as the father, I'm the one who has to do this, yeah. to be the one to say to my family, Come for, on. first to say to myself, and you probably can relate to yeah, this. I can, yeah. Like, hey everybody, I know you're all doing what you really enjoy doing <laughs> and you're all doing what you want to do. And I was currently doing what I wanted to do. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what if we stop that? We're going to stop that. <laughs> I'm going to give you a nice little warning as if you had a choice. You have yeah. got about in 10 or 20 minutes, we're going to pray the rosary. Yeah. And then 20 minutes comes by and I do it starting. I'm, I'm being completely candid. I hope nobody judges me. This is just me. I'm kind of like, here we go. Uh, my wife, great woman. She's the same way. We're doing it. We're being obedient to father. My kids aren't fighting with me because I've raised them in obedience, etc. My son will kneel down with me. My middle daughter, she'll sit and she'll kneel down for her decade. My six-year-old will lay on the couch. My two-year-old will run in circles, pull Good. people's rosaries. I'm so glad. Uh, my I'm so wife, glad no one's levitating. Nobody, no one will be nobody, to, nobody. Yeah. But I'll tell you what happens. Around the third or fourth decade, something happens and my wife and I look at each other and we're like, thanks be to God we're doing this. Mm, this is the first time. So true. There's, this is the first time nobody's looking at a screen. Mm. This is the first time nobody has an agenda for themselves. Um, and we're together as a family, trying our best to follow God. And Beautiful. it, and just because it doesn't feel good, doesn't mean it's not fruitful. Yeah. And I can see that difference in my children because when the, the, I'm, I don't know about people who homeschool, but if you have a kid who goes to, on average goes to public school or goes to private Catholic school, the fact that they're in Catholic school does not mean that they're going to keep the faith. I have seen it time and time again, and I know this is true for my own family that when you get the children to say. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Even if they even if they don't mean it, even if they're saying it half-heartedly, that child has Mary as their mother. Mm -hmm. And although they might leave your house and forget about her, she won't forget about them. Mm -hmm. And at the hour of their death, those 50 times 365 days times 10 years of their life, they will not, I don't, I don't believe that they will go to hell because all those Hail Marys are going to come upon them and the oh, Mother of God is going to res rescue them. So you're doing four a day. I'm doing more than that, but I'll tell you about my son real quick. Wow. So my son was struggling. He was about the fourth or fifth grade. He was having trouble at school, just growing pains emotionally, whatever. He comes to me and he's like, dad, I'm struggling. And I said, well, we'll get you counseling. We'll take you to a counselor. Hmm. But something that you should consider, try praying four rosaries a day. Like consider it. Hmm. Like I'm not, I'm not going to force you. I'm not going to check on you, but consider it. He's been praying four rosaries a day since he was in the fourth or fifth grade. A holy mackerel. And and he is a <laughs> wow. good he is a good kid. He's not perfect. I'm not perfect. He's not going to be, you know, he is my child. So he's got his own quirks and mm. austin austin whatever the word is, weirdnesses. But he's a wonderful young man and I'm very proud of him. Um and I'm not worried about him whatsoever. And and I let him hang out with the the kids in our youth group whose parents don't shelter them. Um and I have seen and I've just seen it that if you have four pillars in your, in your spiritual life in families, these four pillars, our lady gave at Fatima to sister Lucia after the other two shepherd children died. She called them the first Saturday devotion, which is confession, mm -hmm. uh, 15 minutes meditating with the blessed sacrament, praying the rosary, receiving Holy communion. If you have confession, adoration, rosary, and Eucharist in some part of your family's life, I've just seen your children are going to be great. Like this, the power of the sacraments, the power of Our Lady's promises, I just have no mm. doubt. Like I've never seen it go wrong, wrong. And people have told me, well, aren't you afraid that by forcing your children to pray the rosary that you're going to drive them away from the Catholic faith? 
And in all honesty, I can say from a clear conscience, my experience is if they don't pray the rosary, they're destined to leave the Catholic faith. I even had two, I had one gentleman come up to me who became- Well, it would be one thing if you were demanding that your son pray his rosary no, no, every no, no, day. No, 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 not at all. Yeah, no, never. Right. That's, I would never. That's different. Yeah, I don't push it on anybody. Yeah. Not, not my own children, not my wife or anybody. I just propose yeah. and I say, are you open to trying it? And I always tell people, try it for seven days. A lot of times, because many people, again, Father Ripperger, I'm friends with other exorcists, they would they would argue that one in three people suffer from a diabolical obsession. Just for so the listener's context, you already know. This is where you have an obsessive thought. Maybe it's about lust. Maybe it's about self-harm or self-hatred or a depression. It feels all, almost as if you, you're trying to drive the car of your life and there's another outside force trying mm -hmm. to grab the wheel and lead you where you don't want to go. Yeah. Um, so he would say that, Father Ripperger would say one in three. I would argue maybe it's one in two because I, I'm not working with college Catholic university students. I'm working with run of the mill daily public school kids. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I would say maybe one in two. I would say ma the majority of them have addictions to pornography. A lot of them are doing drugs. Um, and when somebody begins to pray for, sometimes their obsession will get worse. Like it'll, they'll say, man, I started praying the rosary and it, it, it brought more curses on my life. My life was bad. Now it's miserable. You've met people who've said that. Oh, 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 a lot of people. I just got a testimonial from a man whose wife had a diabolical obsession. He just sent me this in an email the other day. His wife had a diabolical obsession. She was watching ghost stories. Um, she stopped frequenting the sacraments. She had an aversion to the sacred. She felt like God hated her. Um, he, I told him, do you want to save her? I, I can't promise you it's going to work, but I've seen success. If you do a 54 day novena of four rosaries a day, he said, towards the end of the novena, his wife randomly out of nowhere went to confession. She came back did a 33-day consecration to the Virgin Mary, began wearing the miraculous medal, and now, this is just within the past two months, now she prays four rosaries a day every single day and mm -hmm. goes to the Blessed Sacrament frequently. So it works when people are desperate. When you've got a problem, Our Lady will rescue you. Mm. So I have found in families like that, I even had somebody who I think also went to university here. He said, Gabe, I disagree with you, uh, my father made us pray the rosary every single day. Our, my mom left the family and I hated that he made us pray it. And I said, tell me about your life. He's like, well, I'm becoming a priest. And, and your brother? Well, he's also a priest. I was like, do you understand to have two vocations in one family is not normal? Do you understand to have two vocations in a family with one parent is not normal? If it made you despise the Virgin Mary, maybe it's because your mom left the family and not because the mother of God mm. was being invoked in your house on a regular basis. I, I, if I were you, I would take a careful look and say, perhaps the only reason you and your brother have vocations is because of the mother of God protecting you. So definitely, definitely do not impose whatsoever. I personally believe that it needs to come in prayer because you can co go to one of my talks or one of my, watch one of my videos. And if you say, Gabe told me I should do this. It's not going to stick. But if in prayer, you genuinely imagine using mental prayer, I hope we can talk about mental prayer. It's so powerful. In mental prayer, you look at the eyes of the Virgin Mary and she says, my son, my daughter, try this for seven days. And if she says that and it touches your heart, it's not just here, it goes here. Got to try it. Now, I want to talk about the luminous mysteries. Yes, I've seen please. you talk about it, actually. I'm very passionate about this. I um. Well, first of all, is it the 1962 Missal, the kind of the regular Latin Mass? I don't go to Latin Mass, but that kind of Missal has this section on the Rosary. Yes, and it says that here's what the Rosary is. It's the, it's the five mysteries. Yes. It's the Our Father, the Ten Hail Marys, and anything in addition to that mm -hmm. is not specifically mm -hmm. part of the Rosary, which made right. me so happy. Right. I don't know if you've heard me talk about yes, this. Yes, no, this no, me too. Piety spell. Yeah, oh my gosh, where, get out of my house. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's so get it done, baby. I I like to get it done as well. Um. I don't know where I was going with that, but so good. the luminous mysteries. Many people right. will say that's yeah. If if the mother of God gave the rosary, it was perfect the way she gave it. How are you going to have a pope, especially John Paul II, suggest we do more? And suggest so, is the right is the that's key the keyword there. Yeah. So the premise that they're suggesting is that the mother of God gave the rosary a specific way, and therefore it's perfect. That's a false premise. So when the Virgin Mary appeared to St. Dominic and said, preach my Psalter, mm -hmm. a reference to the 150 Psalms, which people may have already been using 150 beads to pray mm -hmm. Hail Marys. At that time, the Hail Mary was only the first half. Cool. Let's go back to that then. I agree. 
So my beef isn't with John Paul II. My beef is with Pius V. Because it was Pius V who added, Holy Mary, Mother of God, oh, pray you're, for you're us sinners now at the hour of death. would Amen. like to go back. Well, he doubled the freaking rosary. Oh, yeah. No, that's so true. And, that's, it, and nobody it, has a problem with that? He was a pope. So yeah. if your premise is John Paul II shouldn't add anything to something that is perfect, why are you just giving pa Pius yeah, V yeah. the pass? Yeah, right. That's a false premise. Right. Because he doubled it. Right. And then yeah. w when you take into account the fact that John Paul II said, here's a suggestion, don't yes. have to do it, but you know. I, and it's beautiful. Yes. And he's but, a, but no yeah. honest question though, because yes. as somebody who's now an Eastern Catholic who yes. loves praying the Jesus prayer yes. and loves in, incorporating my breath, mm -hmm. the rosary would be much more enjoyable yes. if I just got to pray that first half. And when I preached about it and I talk about the power of the words Hail Mary full of grace, those words and the importance of the incarnation would be more present. You know what I mean? If you're constantly just saying that first half, yeah. the incarnation would be more present upon my mind. And I think Protestants, there's no way you could deny that it's not 100% yeah. scriptural. Right. But I personally believe that the Holy Father, Pius V, was a very saintly man. He won the Battle of Lepanto right. through his promotion of the rosary. Yeah. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for me a sinner now and at the hour of my death is very reminiscent of the Jesus prayer. Mm -hmm. You just tacked on a whole nother prayer to my Hail Mary. Fine. But I think that it was a wise and prudent decision that he made under the inspiration of the Well, what would you say Spirit. to somebody who said, I, I, I agree with you, and yeah. yet I'm going to stick to the original rosary, and I go just pray it. the first half? Go for it. But let me, let me go for it. Do what you want. <laughs> but I think the mother of God honors the papacy. Yeah, yeah. No, it's a um, good point. I like your point, that if you're going to have beef with John Paul II, you ought to have. Right. And yeah, I, that's good. As you, like when you mentioned John Paul II, my heart fluttered, because uh -huh. I believe he was a mystic. Yeah. He wasn't perfect. He was human, just like all right. of us. And if you look at what the luminous mysteries are, I had mentioned earlier that a grace remembered is a grace renewed. And the aspects of the life of Christ that John Paul II is encouraging us to meditate upon are the exact problems we have in the church. We have a major crisis of baptized unbelievers. Mm -hmm. We have a major crisis in the sacrament of holy matrimony and the belief of the mother of God as mediatrix and intercessor. We have a major crisis in preaching. What Christ preached was the kingdom of God is at hand, repent and believe in the gospel. Yeah. We have a major crisis in the divinity of Christ, which is a transfiguration because philosophers don't glow dazzling white and fly in the sky. Mm -hmm. And we have a major <laughs> crisis in the Eucharist and in the priesthood. Yeah. And so John Paul II is giving us a solution to the problems of our day. And I will say again, from experience, miracles that have happened, I've witnessed so many miracles. I'll just give you one that happened recently. So there was a woman who approached me at a Catholic date night. It's an event we have at St. Teresa's. She came up to me and she said, Gabriel, I do not like you. And I said, I'm sorry, you're not the first. And I was like, is there something that I did wrong? She's like, you are constantly promoting four rosaries. Don't you know that luminous is the Illuminati? And if you divide four by whatever oh number, it's six, 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 six. And I was like, I was you like, are why we can't have nice things, woman. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and I was like, so why? I'm, I'm sorry. Like, I can't help it. I was just enjoying my dinner here. And she's like, but I want you to know. I had ulcers, I had styes, I had all sorts of stress-related health issues. And I heard you say, try the four rosaries. And the first day that I prayed the fourth rosary, all my health issues miraculously went away. Mm. And I've had time and time again, where somebody was praying for an important uh, intention, some people cured of cancer, after they've prayed their fourth rosary. Um, I had several seminarians that I'm friends with or that have shared their testimony with me, they were going to leave their vocation because of desolation, which everybody knows spirituality. You don't make a decision in times of desolation, but they were going to. And somebody challenged them to pray a novena of four rosaries a day. And at the end of their fourth rosary, an outpouring of graces came upon them. They had a sense of the presence of Mary and they are holy and faithful. Some of them are now priests. Some of them mm -hmm. are continuing their vocation. So although it's not necessary, I, I will say that yeah. from experience, Our Lady honors it. Um, no, yeah, yeah. I, I'm in agreement yeah. with you about the beauty, beauty yeah. of the luminous mysteries. My concern, though, is that sometimes in, in encouraging it, it does sound like a mandate. Right. Well, I have and to be. People I have, have to be. The, I'm the promoter. I got to be to the far right. I can't be promoting it right down the middle. Yeah. Because right. if, if I shoot my arrow over here, I might get you halfway. Mm -hmm. But if I shoot halfway, I might just get you a quarter of the way. Yeah, so right. when you ask, do I pray for? I pray more than four because I have to be so convicted that this is powerful that in order for me to be that convicted, I have to be doing more. Yeah. And so when a man comes up to me and says to me, Gabriel, I don't have time to pray for, I can look at him in the eye and say, that's nonsense. 
And then he said, what do you mean? I was like, wake up 30 minutes earlier. No, it's complete nonsense. Of course. Yeah. Wake up 30 the minutes earlier. The amount of earlier. time we spend yeah. doom scrolling and on your, having on your way home, conversations. On your way home from or, work. On your way to work. So wake up 30 minutes earlier. On your way to work. On your way home from work. <laughs> before bed with your family. Mm -hmm. I, I haven't impacted a single thing in your life. I just made you stop listening to talk radio. Mm -hmm. So, But I can say that with like, like, a, like a, a firm wall saying you're full of it. Mm -hmm. Because I'm doing more than you. But I'm not doing, but again, it's not, I need it. I need it. I am the worst and the most sinful of all men. I am. So why don't you pray the um, seven sorrows of Our Lady I Rosary? I do. Every day? So, uh, I pray two a day. And why but don't you do more? Why? Because I need it. And why don't you do more? Oh, why don't, so I, I, I just have discerned a certain, well, one, I think it all depends on your season of life. So there are certain seasons where I pray more. There are certain seasons when I have big things coming up that I sacrifice more for right. because I I'm the, desperate. The point I'm yeah. getting at is there's a, I, I think it was Escriva, yeah. may not have been. I can't find it online, so I'm going to claim it soon Please. if no one can sure. find it. There are many treasuries within the, many devotions within the church's right. treasury. Choose only a few and be faithful to them. Right. I like that a lot. I think there's I a lot that. of wisdom I love in that. It. I love yeah. that. I'm, I'm with you because I get really irritated with people when they're like, purple rosary, green, uh, purple scapular, green scapular, black scapular. No. And so how do, how do I personally differentiate which devotions to get? At Fatima, which is the largest, most popular apparition, there was a vision in the sky, according to Sister Lucia, that Our Lady appeared as Our Lady of Mount Carmel. Mm -hmm. She said to Sister Lucia, I am Our Lady of the Rosary. She had an image of St. Joseph and an image of Our Lady of Sorrows. So those are my major devotions. So it sounds like a lot of this comes to discerning, probably yes. with the help of a Holy Spiritual Father, yes. what your yes. um, prayer rule ought to be. Yes. Yeah. And, and I recommend above all, Learn the, the steps to mental prayer. I want to get to that. It's I want to so have important. a break before yeah, we get let's to do that. that. But yeah. before we do, how do you even hold that rosary? That's way, this, it's way too I big. I love this bad Look boy. Look at the size of that thing. I know. I can't even put it in my pocket. I have to carry it on my belt. I joke with people because I'm from Texas. I open carry. Yeah. And I double Give fist. Give us a look. So here you go. You so take what do you mean you double fist? What so like I have, a, I have a rosary on my belt. I have a rosary on my pinky. My so goodness. it's like I'm an old west cowboy. I got like little <laughs> pistols everywhere. That's beautiful, man. Thank you. Thank you. No, All right, pleasure. let's take a break yeah, let's and do it. we'll come back. I want to tell you about Hallow, which is the number one downloaded prayer app in the world. It's outstanding. Hallow.com slash Matt Frad. Sign up over there right now and you will get the first three months for free. That's like a lot of time. You can decide whether it's useful to you or not, whether it's helpful. If you don't like it, you can always quit. Hallow.com slash Matt Frad. I use it. My family uses it. It's fantastic. There are over 10,000 audio guided prayers, meditations, and music, including my lo-fi. Hello has been downloaded over 15 million times in 150 different countries. It helps you pray. It helps you meditate. helps you sleep better. It helps you build a daily routine and a habit of prayer. There's honestly so much excellent stuff on this app that it's difficult to get through it all. Just go check it out. Hello dot com slash Matt Frad. The link is in the description below. It even has an entire section for kids. So if you're a parent, uh, you could play little Bible stories to them at night. It'll help them pray. Fantastic. Hello dot com slash Matt Frad. I want to tell you about a course that I have created for men to overcome pornography. It is called strive 21.com slash Matt. You go there right now, or if you text strive to 66866, we'll send you the link. It's 100% free, and it's a course I've created to help men, to give them the tools to overcome pornography. Usually men know that porn is wrong. They don't meet, need me or you to convince them that it's wrong. What they need is a battle plan to get out. And so I've distilled all that I've learned over the last 15 or so years as I've been talking and writing on this topic into this one course. Think of it as if you and I could have a coffee over the next 21 days and I would kind of guide you along this journey. That's basically what this is. It's incredibly well produced. Uh, we had a whole camera crew come and film this. Um, and I think it'll be a really a real help to you. And it's also not an isolated course that you go through on your own because literally tens of thousands of men have now gone through this course. And as you go through the different videos, there's comments from men all around the world encouraging each other, offering to be each other's accountability partners and things like that. Strive21, that's strive21.com slash Matt, or as I say, text, text strive to 66866 to get started today. You won't regret it. What can't you talk about? <laughs> so your wife did a very good job mm. evangelizing about carnivore. I know. If only we were as passionate about Christ and Our Lady as 
carnival people are as passionate as carnival. So when I was growing up, I got on medication for attention deficit disorder when I was like in the second grade. Okay. And yeah. they did a lot of food testing before, and they were saying that I'm allergic to these various foods, and the reaction that I'm having is mental and emotional. And so it's making me have brain fog and all these things. And so I had to go to school in the first grade with a thermos of like beans and tuna fish. And of course I got made fun of because I was a little kid at a public school with my thermos and my beans and tuna fish. Mm. And so I opted for taking Ritalin and Adderall up until I was like 30 years old. Really? Yeah. And then I began to become addicted to the Adderall. I was taking more and more to have the same effect. Yeah. So I'd be taking like 30 milligrams three times a day, which is a lot of Adderall. It? And it was barely having the same impact, wow. but it was making me um, more edgy. And so if you, if you look at my early YouTube videos, I you might say that I'm like edgy now, but in my early YouTube videos, I'm very bitter oh. and like angry. <laughs> really? And it seems like I'm like, what is this guy angry about? Okay. But it was because I was going through withdrawals from Adderall. Really? And so I gave it up, slowly worked my way out of it, got rid of all my medication. But I knew in my heart that diet was the answer. And when I would eat certain foods, mainly foods that were made by human hands in factories, in packaging, in boxes. And again, I didn't want to really keep that diet. So I used intermittent fasting. Yeah. Spiritually, for spiritual reasons, also for health reasons. Sure. And then I would eat at night and then I could become a vegetable and go to sleep and all these things. But then when Cameron talked about her venture into carnivore and how that impacted yeah, this is just recently. autoimmune stuff. Yeah, I know. I've only been doing carnivore since like January 1st. Okay. Um, I was like, I've got to try this. Okay. I've got to try this. And mental clarity, I'll tell you right now, mental clarity Dude, it's remarkable. through the roof. It's too much clarity now sometimes. I'm, <laughs> too much. No, I'm off it now. Yeah. I, I did it in January. Um, and it's funny. I went back to normal food and mm -hmm. I lost that mental clarity. But I didn't care because yeah. the bread just tastes so good. You know, you, I miss bread. I miss bananas. I miss peanut butter. Mm -hmm. So my question for you is when she travels, like y'all went to Austria, how did she fare on the plane? What did you, you take steaks with you? What did you do? Yeah. So we took, she did a lot of chips, like yes. meat chips that yeah, she put chips. in the oven and uh, we just ate meat the whole way. But what's funny is now we're in Austria. She's tried to open up her diet to a few things. Mm -hmm. Some things have worked. So she's incorporated berries from time yes. to time. So blueberries in full fat, you know, yes. yogurt with nothing else yes. in it. But then she tried to have, have a glass of wine. Okay. Messed her up. A whole week. Oh my she gosh. was destroyed. Yeah. yeah. And I'm someone, I have a lot of compassion on my wife. I love her. I want her to be happy. But I'm like, don't ever do that again. Right. <laughs> like, please right. just eat the meat. Right. So she hasn't gone off it. It's been like right. six months. And then and she's we, happy. We and bought a healthy. whole cow uh, in Austria. Uh, butchered it, not a live yeah, cow. Yeah, right. um, no, she's terrific. She's off all of her meds. And do you think that this is something she's going to do long term for the rest I of her life? I think it's going to have to be. Right. And I'm sad to say that. Right. But it, but there's also a part of me that's like, but babe, like I need you, and you and sh and and I don't need to tell her that. Right. She she knows that being in pain uh, is worse right. than just eating meat. You so know. you need her to be able to be a, 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 oh my a God. providing Dude, it's member been of the three family. Three years of yeah. brutality. Yeah. I mean, she's months uh, there'll be days she'll just wake up she can't leave her chair right yeah um yeah. she can't wake up i mean she does she's a very right. self-motivated cleric individual she gets up she she puts in an effort but it she's always and she's always been in pain right. always but these last i said this on the show a month in carnivore she started losing weight and i was getting really nervous because right. she does not need to lose weight right. i want to fat actually yes and, uh, but i'd say two or three months in i touched her leg i'm like honey you're getting muscle she just she looks yes. good and and she's not working out and she's just eating meat and she looks like she's working out i was out. doing carnivore and i was, so when i started i was a little bit underweight because I'd been doing a lot of fasting and so i was like i'm going to do carnivore straight for like 2 weeks i gained weight and i was like so I was like 155, 156, 157, fluctuating between there. And then when I did carnivore straight, my weight went up to like 163 and it stayed there yeah. consistently. So I think that if you're trying to lose weight, I don't know this for a fact, but it feels like if you're trying to lose weight and you need to lose weight, carnivore will bring you to where yes, you should be optimally. That's right. And if you're underweight yes. and you're doing carnivore, I think it's going to bring you to where you need to be yes, optimally. Yes. So I do, I do meat, 
cheese, eggs, yeah. and berries. But I'm doing too many berries. Like I'm in a confession yeah. of sin here. I'm eating like 50% berries, two cartons of strawberries, berries two cartons of blueberries. Is so good, dude. <sighs> I need it. No, it's it's <clears throat> it's really amazing. And you know, we did that video. Yeah. And uh, you know, usually on videos, any kind of video, right. you got people pushing back, being upset, yes. being critical. If you go to that, I think we've got over a thousand comments. Yes. And they're all saying the same thing. Yes. It's like what you just said about the rosary. Yes. Like, here's what I know. When I right. do it, this happens. And That's then people come analogy. in and they say the same thing happened. So all these comments are like, I had this wrong with me, that wrong with me. I started eating meat. It's every remarkable. Every video on carnivore, the comments are the greatest testimonial. Like people are like, I was, because there's old people who are like, I don't want to have cholesterol problems. So like, I was 78 and dying. And now I'm like looking like I'm, it's my body's when nuts, I was 40. dude. Yeah. So, did you do that to help you with ADD? To help me with ADD, mental clarity, um, yeah. And and has it hap- worked? Yeah, um, well, I'm- Has I, it continued I, to work? I feel, it seems I like feel it's sharp. <laughs> do you plan on using this long term? I, I want to start adding things back, but I don't know what to add back. Like I toyed with bananas and apples just because I love peanut butter. I don't know why. Oh my gosh, Skippy. peanut butter's the best. I know, I loved it. But then Especially I would notice, sugar in it. I would wake up and I would like have puffy eyes. And so mm-hmm. I'd be like, mm, I know that it's causing some inflammation. So I'm discerning. It's a work in progress. I think that's I it. it. Now, I'm not an expert. Sure, My wife knows a lot more yeah. on this and she's not an expert. But I think it's just that food that causes inflammation. And then when you cut out everything but beef, you're no longer having inflammation. Like right now, my elbow is hurting. Yeah. And I can't, I was at the gym today. I couldn't do many pull-ups. And I know that if I- Was doing carnivore, you wouldn't be hurting? I, yeah, I know that. And yeah, I kind of don't care. Right. It's, that's kind of like sin. But that's kind of like me like, when I was taking my Adderall. I was like, I'll uh, just give me the pills. I'll now, eat whatever I want. I got questions about sure. Adderall and this sort of stuff. Because I'm, if I'm quite sure I have ADD and- Here's why, and I don't. Really I'm not know. gonna. I'm not gonna die. I don't know what ADD. You want. I don't really know what ADD sure. is. So you can help me. A lot of the time, it feels like there's a million trains of thought going through my head at once, and it's hard to kind of connect to one. But then when I get really into something, I get so into that thing, it's like it freaks everybody around me out. That's one thing. The other thing is, if I go to like a mall or something like that, mm-hmm. I get exhausted really quickly because there's too much to yes. look at, and my brain it's like it can't process or zero in on yes. information. So I've shared that with a someone, and they say, "Well, it might be ADD." So I tried one of these Ritalin or Adderall, Adderall. I don't yeah. know what I tried, yeah. but I tried it, and it it had a similar effect to drinking like too much coffee. Mm-hmm. Like I was just zoned in, right? But in a way that I didn't like. Now it might be because of the dosage or whatever. But what's your like recommendation for people with ADD? How did you do on carnivore? I mean, it's fantastic. But but did you have, was your, were all the... That's a really good question. I I remember on, so, okay. So Aquinas in the, I'm going to get to it. Aquinas in the Summa gives three benefits for fasting. And one is it allows us to contemplate God. Mm -hmm. And this is a natural way of viewing that benefit. And that is to say, I think when we're eating crap, bread and soda or whatever else, our body spends so much time just trying to process crap right. that we can't recall things as quickly. We can't think through things. You get rid of all that junk and the brain has a lot more energy to be focused right. on. So I noticed that recalling things was a lot easier. I remember being like really aware of that. Like, wow, I just, I'm not usually that quick. And I know it was because I was just eating meat. Yeah. That yeah. was it. But I, I don't know. About the ADD stuff. I don't know. Right. So I, maybe you do, or maybe you just have food sensitivities. When I, whenever I talk to people about carnivore, those who do it, like swear by it. But then those who don't, they're like, you're crazy. Yeah. Because I, what really stood out to me was the writing or the, the podcast. Some guy was like, plants are trying to kill you. And I was like, wait a second. What are you talking about? Plants are trying to kill me. And he was this guy. And I don't know how true it is. So maybe I'm just spouting ignorance, but I think it kind of makes sense that if you go outside and you eat any mm, leaves right. or grass, you're gonna get sick because the grass and the leaves are trying to protect themselves. So they have toxins that they release, but they want you to eat their berries because that's how they thrive. And so berries that have seed bearing plants that are gonna spread if you eat them, they want you to eat them so they taste good and they're good for you. So I know Jordan Peterson is on the carnivore diet. He had a lot of psoriasis and skin issues when he gave up leafy greens, all of his skin issues went away. So it's like, I don't, I don't, I believe in it. I, I personally believe in it because I've seen the effects, but at the same time, I don't necessarily want everybody to do it because then the cost of meat is going to go up and it's going to make <laughs> it more difficult for my lifestyle. But if you're struggling with mental clarity, um, skin issues, uh, autoimmune disease, joint problems like your yeah. wife, like seriously, try it. Has your wife noticed a difference? Um, I don't know. Is she joining you no, with she this endeavor? No, she does not endeavor? support 
I've got a lot. <laughs> she does not support me in this endeavor. Okay. No, but but this is what I love so much. I love my wife for many reasons. But one of the greatest things about my wife is that she allows me to do all the things that I believe God is calling me to do. Even when that sounds like never eating a broccoli or an asparagus mm. or a Brussels sprout for the rest of my life. Now, I will say this. Yeah. I... <laughs> About a month into doing carnivore, I had people saying, you look thin. Right. But the way they said it, it was not in a good way. <laughs> right. <laughs> like, people look, tell me that you too. You look sick. You don't look sick. You look good. No, I, I feel good. And yeah. a lot of people who tell me that are overweight. Oh. So no, it's like, I think I actually look sick. <laughs> it, it, it might be a transition time. You, yeah. But you look at your wife and you think, man, you're looking she good. She looks great. Yeah. Now, but what was funny was I got to a point where I got really sick of meat. Oh, man. Tell me about it. Oh, okay. So let me flesh yeah. this out and you tell me. Flesh this out. No pun intended. No pun intended. So intended is fun. This is a beautiful I, one. I would fast all day. Yeah. And then around 3 p.m., my wife and I would drive and we'd get this glorious steak. Oh, man. And in the beginning, I'm sucking the cartilage. I'm chewing the fat. It was beautiful. But one day we went and I was just like, oh, I can't do it. I can't do it. I, <laughs> I think that's why I started losing weight in a yes. bad way because I wasn't eating any food. Right. My, all of my signals when right. to eat was messed up. Right. And I would say even up until now, I'm a little, the smell of mince meat, it wow. really turns me off. Wow. I'm hoping to get over this quickly because right. I would like to get back to that. Right. So were you doing berries? No, not so at the time. So this is the key. So sugar makes you hungry. And so if you have some berries before dinner time, you're going to turn into an animal and you're going to want that okay. beef big time. Because I noticed that because I was like, I'll have berries. Normally what happens with me is I eat steak or hamburger or whatever it is or eggs and then i'm like ah oh, too much grease too much grease too much fat yeah. and then so i'm like downing trays of strawberries <laughs> and then afterwards i'm starving again okay. because of the sugar interesting so yeah. keep that in mind if you're if you're ever struggling to make yourself want to eat because you're not hungry anymore because beef doesn't have that effect on you yeah and the reason why beef is so good for you if you have a lot of autoimmune issues is because cows have multiple stomachs with which they process all of these toxins that they they're do eating. it for you they do it for you because yeah. your stomach doesn't have that same ability but i i will say that during those times i would just eggs and cheese yes okay just eggs and cheese a ton of eggs yeah. and cheese worked for me do a medical advice disclaimer for me, please, says Thursday. We are not advising that anybody do this. Speak to your doctor Again, before trying anything like this. Everything I've ever learned, I've learned on YouTube. <laughs> Technologically <laughs> and medically. <laughs> but we're not suggesting you do that. I'm not suggesting uh, yeah, you do that we're either. Just saying, fantastic. Now, earlier you wanted to talk about mental prayer. Yes, you mental said prayer. this is something you've gotten into the last oh years. Oh, my goodness. Whoa, it is the game changer. What is mental prayer? So it's the game changer. It is... So, you know, people say the greatest attack of the devil is to make people believe the devil doesn't exist, which is obviously false because I believe that the devil existed and I was not living the commandments afterwards. See, yeah. The devil's biggest attack on the church and on society is to keep people from mental prayer. So I had no... I, I went through a large, like, year-long dryness, interior desolation, and I knew I was missing something. That I, there was like some piece in my spiritual life that was missing. And through a, a couple of chain of events, it turned out that some of my friends were like, oh, we just did this thing called mental prayer. It was very fruitful. And I was like, imagination, I'm not doing that. That sounds so effeminate. I'm like, you keep your imagination to yourself. Um, mm. But then I was researching it because these seminarian friends of mine had gone to the Institute for Priestly Formation. And they were like telling me, they're like, you won't believe this. I spent the day with the Lord and me and him are friends. I'm like, that doesn't sound extraordinary to me. You're friends with the Lord. That's what you're supposed to be. Mm. But they were talking about an experience with God that they really believed happened. Yeah. And it happened in here and in here. And it was so real yeah. that they were acting different. And then so I went and researched it and I looked up Teresa of Avila because she's a doctor of prayer. And she said, the devil knows when a soul has begun mental prayer that he has lost that soul forever. And then another quote she said, which really took me off guard. She said, those who do not practice mental prayer have no need of demons because they cast themselves into hell. And then I looked at, okay, well, there's got to be other doctors of the church who've talked about this. St. Alphonsus says, every saint was made a saint through mental prayer. Without mental prayer, you will not be able to overcome your sins. Uh, St. Francis de Sales, St. Uh, John of the Cross, St. All, all of the great saints were using the word mental prayer mm -hmm. and meditation interchangeably. Mm -hmm. And so when I heard meditation, I thought, think of a picture. You know, think of a picture. Okay, there's Mary with the baby Jesus. Okay, I got it in my head. Um, but that's not what they meant. So I, I have boiled it down to three steps that if you do this, 
According to Teresa of Avila, mental prayer is the gateway to all the higher forms of prayer, that when darkness enters the soul, which it happens to every individual, even devout people, there's an interior darkness that can settle in that you can't seem to shake. That's like really can be crippling that the ordinary means of removing interior darkness from the soul is mental prayer. So I didn't have this in my life. And when I was reading this, I was like, this is what I've been missing. And once learning mental prayer before, when I was praying, it was like I was squeezing oranges a lot just to get a single drop yeah. of juice. But with mental prayer, even on a bad day, when I use these steps promoted by Teresa of Avila, St. Francis de Sales, St. Alphonsus, um, even a bad day of mental prayer was more fruitful than no, no mental prayer whatsoever. Before you get to the steps, yes. can you give us a quick definition of what yes. it means? So mental prayer is essentially using your interior faculties. So you and I are talking to each other. We're using our eyes. We're using our mouth. But God does not communicate exteriorly. Mm. He communicates interiorly. And you and I have two essential interior faculties. So we have our will, mm -hmm. our heart, our emotions. If, we didn't, if, if that's all we had, you and I would just do whatever feels good. We also have an intellect, mm -hmm. our, ra our rationality, our imagination, our intuition. Our intellect informs our will. So I have to mm -hmm. engage God in my intellect, in my imagination, and that's where he's gonna communicate. And sometimes he'll communicate directly to the will, but ordinarily I get him to talk to my heart by using my intellect and my imagination and mm -hmm. encountering him there. And so Teresa of Avila, when she says, the devil knows that he's lost you, when you do mental prayer, it's because the devil's primary attack on you and on me, at least for, for the majority of my life, was in my intellect. I would sin by imagining, by lusting, by going, I, I'd have panic attacks and anxiety attacks because of the things that I was entertaining in my mind. Mm -hmm. Sins of my past, worries about the future was, were keeping me from God right here, right now in the present moment. Mm -hmm. And so what Teresa of Avila, and, and, and this is a difficulty because when I try to teach this, some people will say, all the doctors are saying this is necessary. And I, I have so many quotes yeah. um, from so many saints about the, the necessity of mental prayer. Some people will say, I can't use my imagination. I don't have that ability, which is completely false. Like if I were to say, imagine the face of your wife, Cameron, anybody who's yeah. ever seen her could use her imagination to imagine what she looks like. Mm -hmm. We could do it. Maybe we're not good at it. Maybe it's not always clear, mm -hmm. but that act of the will, that using of your imagination impacts your heart a little bit. Yeah. It makes you think of her, makes Absolutely, you love her. Yeah. Um, so that's one big area that a lot of people will push back on. Using your imagination to encounter Christ who is present. Now, I, I, you may be getting to this, but I think sure. another thing people would push back on is like, surely this could also be dangerous. Sure. Uh, it's not always the case that what I'm imagining comes from the Lord. Right. I might be deceived. Yes, 100%. So then you, the basics of discernment of spirits are when it is the Lord, in the words of Teresa of Avila, when he speaks, he acts. So you could be in a moment of trauma and interior darkness, and you could be saying to yourself, Matt, God is with you. God, And we do, we say this to ourselves. God loves me. The Blessed Mother's with me. Uh, my guardian angel's with me. And you say these things over. Like, be, be at peace. God is with you. God is peace. And you know that's you by what's going on here. But when the voice of the Lord comes upon you and he says, mm -hmm. my son, Matt, I love you, be at peace. You feel it Amen. here yeah. and here. Deeply and in the stomach almost, and it, yeah. Yeah, and it, it flows through you mm -hmm. because when God speaks, he acts. And so it's very important for everybody so that we're not you know, being pulled around by lies, that we discern all the movements. And even you, you could be, and people tell me this, I was doing a mental prayer and Jesus was yelling at me and he was telling me that I'm ugly. And I said, well, how did that make your soul feel? Mm. Uh, ashamed, dirty. I was like, then mm, that's whose the voice is that? Brethren, yeah. He's dressing up as Christ. Mm. But according to many of the great saints is that when you start to do this type of prayer, it is the safest place to encounter Christ. So again, to sum it up, mental prayer is, you, you talked about imagination and will. Right. Um, it's in, so it's a framework, it's a step process by which you encounter Christ. If you okay. encounter Christ in step one, you don't need step two and three. If you encounter Christ in step two, you don't need step three. If okay. you, if, so it's, it's a framework, it's a set of systematic guidelines to encounter Christ in the safest, most fruitful place possible, which is the gospels. The gospel, encountering Christ in the gospels, you trying to use your imagination to encounter Christ in the gospels brings the power of the Holy Spirit, you're in a safe place. 
The devil, does, flies do not land on boiling water and the gospels are boiling water. And when you invoke your guardian angel and you invoke the Holy Spirit to come upon you, you're surrounding yourself in the safest place for prayer. Mm. Is it possible mm. to be deceived? It's possible, but you will know it in your soul because mm -hmm. God doesn't want you to be deceived. Those who are deceived mm -hmm. only want to be deceived. The devil only steals those who want to be stolen because God is good. And if I want to encounter him, he's not going to hide behind a devil, maybe for mm -hmm. some rare trial, mm -hmm. but God wants to speak to every single one of his children. Amen. So that's good. So it, there's three basic steps okay. and I'll, I'll share them with you. And you can do this. Oh my gosh. It is so powerful. If you do this at mass. It is so powerful if you do this before the Blessed Sacrament. It's so powerful if you do this at any prayer. Transforms everything. The first one, we, you and I already discussed, make an act of faith in the presence of God. Mm -hmm. Make an act of faith saying, Lord Jesus, Son of the living God, I believe you are here with me. I believe you're holding me into existence. I believe that I'm a member of the body of Christ. I believe I'm a temple of the Holy Spirit. I believe you're here. That, that's a prayer. That's a prayer. Sometimes if you're going to have a long prayer session, I would recommend saying, Holy Spirit, help me to pray. St. Michael, guardian angel, wrap your wings of protection around my mind and my heart so that I won't be mm -hmm, distracted. Mm -hmm. But if you're, just, if, you, if you're working, all you have to say is, Lord Jesus, Son of God, I believe you're here. Step one, make an act well, this of faith. Is, I mean, what you're saying is what the saints have also emphasized, placing yourself in the presence of God. Yes. And Teresa makes a big deal about this, as she ought to, right? Often we just talk to God yes. like yeah. he's either not there right. or not worthy of our, all of our worship right. and honor. And so if you make an act of faith in the presence of God, and all of a sudden you're overwhelmed with his presence, mm. talk to him there. The goal of prayer is communication. Talk to him. Let him speak to you. She recommends, St. Francis de Sales recommends this too, and this is what really caught me off guard, is that they said the ordinary means of meditation is to visualize the person and the scene as if you're present there. So let's say you go to pray. You're like, okay, I'm going to do my evening prayers. Lord, I believe you're really here. Don't feel it. I don't feel like you're here. Then I go to the next step. So let's pretend like we're praying the third joyful mystery, the birth of the child Jesus in Bethlehem. Mm -hmm. You imagine the child Jesus as a real fat baby in your arms and you're looking into his eyes. Mm -hmm. And you just look to the best of your ability. Maybe you can't see his face, but you can see fat baby hands. Anything that touches you in the gospel, mm -hmm. it's inspired word of God, focus on that. And when that touches your heart, so step one is active faith in the presence of God. Step two is consideration, because what this, the consideration is doing is it's stirring up the Holy Spirit in you. So now I'm imagining a fat baby. Is God really present in this room with me? Yes. Am I imagining this baby? I am, but is God present? He is. So now I'm going to talk to Christ, this baby. This is step three. So consider the gospel scene as if it's really present. Step three is talk to the baby Lord God, you are so tender. You are so loving. You are so merciful. My wife is suffering terribly. I beg of you, give her some comfort. Give her some relief. And then you look at the eyes of the Blessed Mother. Mm. Blessed Mother, you, never was it known that anybody who went to you was left unaided. And then you pause. This is what most Catholics do not do. We're, a lot of us, myself included, are afraid to hear what God has to say to us. And so he doesn't speak. The saints say that God does not want to speak to those who are not willing to listen. And so you say that prayer, whatever's on your heart. This is so important. We have to communicate mm -hmm. what's on the soul. Stop playing games. You're bothered about something that you don't feel is fair. Tell baby Jesus, I don't believe this is fair. You pause. You let him, if he wants to speak, you can just look at his eyes and be like, don't you trust me? Like you're holding me. I trust you to hold me. Some, mm. he, he will either move in the heart or an idea will enter the mind that affects the soul or you'll have an overwhelming understanding or you'll just have peace. It, it takes literally, if you're doing this with your rosary, it takes an extra 20 seconds. And if at the very least you don't hear God, you did a good job of presenting to your imagination that God loves me so much that he became a child and he'd be willing to let strangers hold him. Beautiful. So yeah. mental prayer, if you do this at mass and you like, let's say you guys have a good liturgy, the priest walks up, he says the blessed sacrament, the prayers over the, uh, the host, words of consecration, lifts the host up. He does it so reverently, so slowly, with so much love and fervor. Mm -hmm. That's a good day at mass. Yeah. But imagine if you closed your eyes and you imagined what's really happening. You're at the crucifixion. You see the feet of Christ that are crucified. You look up his, his legs. You see blood dripping down. You look at his chest, barely able to breathe. You look at his face and you see the mm -hmm. heavens have opened up above the, above the altar. 
Is that your imagination? 100%. Is it really happening? Yes. And the person who receives Holy Communion at a mass where they've opened their heart to that divine reality mm -hmm. receives far more grace than previously available. St. Alphonsus says, God rarely answers those who do not do mental prayer. And then when I've pondered that quote, I took that to mean because that's the real God. So is the opposite of this way of praying that you're talking about uh, treating God more like a syllogism than a love affair, Chesterton's kind of idea, right? Where yeah. I know the right things to do. I know the right prayers to pray. I know that it's right to do this, but I'm not praying with the heart. I'm not yes. engaging. This is the prayer of the heart. This yeah. is the prayer of the heart to a God who has a will for me here and now. Yeah. I think that the this biggest- is, This is why I love the charismatics. Me too. And this is the biggest problem in the church. We are so <laughs> easy doing the same stupid things over and over again and getting no results. We're not willing to change. I, I liken it to if I had financial problems and I went to Dave Ramsey. Yeah, yeah Dave Ramsey. I, was, I, I hate getting him confused with Gordon Ramsey because he's yeah, like yeah. the chef. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> so if I had financial problems and I was going on Dave Ramsey and I said, these are all my issues. He would say, we're going to need a major overhaul here, baby. You cannot keep doing the same things you're doing. And the church year after year does the same things over and over again, even though they're not working. And that goes for the faithful as well as the hierarchy. And it's, it, it really, I believe, comes down to a lack of true, authentic prayer where God has the opportunity to speak back to me. This is good. I want, I want to dwell on this for a moment. The reason Please. I just said I love the charismatics yeah. is, because, mm, is because it's easy to live a Christian life that looks good enough yes. from the outside, but... It's as if God doesn't even exist, that he's not even interested in me here and now, that he loves me here and now, that he has a plan for my life that's very concrete here and now. Whereas the reason I just said I love the charismatics is these these people who, they act as if God works now, right. that he's alive now. Yes. Here's an analogy. Sometimes you'll be on a busy street and there'll be an entertainer, right, who's got silver paint all over themselves. They pretend to be a statue. And sometimes they look so real that you might even kind of go up to them and look mm. at them. Now, just imagine you think this person's a statue and they move. That reaction is the reaction God wants us to have about yes. his reality, yes. that he's alive. He's I on the it. move now. I love it. So beautiful. So this is this what you're saying, that mental prayer helps us? Mental prayer, it helps you because it is God who consoles. It is God who speaks. Yeah. And if you make decisions well discerned, God will have you do things that you're not ordinarily going to do. After the apostles met Christ, he said, come, follow me. Mm. And he, he meant that. And on a daily basis, he tells us that to deny ourselves, take up our cross. Follow, you, you, this is a little scary. Walk over here with me. Let's see what happens if you allow me to live and act through you. We, I've brought up the charismatics a lot. So people might think that I'm a very charismatic individual. I'm also very traditional. I believe in the charismatic renewal. They need tradition. They need structure. Mm -hmm. They need the disciplines of the church. They need devotional life and the sacramental, the fruit of a beautiful liturgy. It's a both and. Um, you can't do, you, you will fail without both and. Mm -hmm. But yeah, so I, mental prayer, it changes everything. So one of the, the big things- So that, what will you do? You said this has revolutionized your prayer life right. and that you only really discovered this a but year ago year, or yeah. so. Now, I'm, clearly, just from the stories you've shared with me, you've encountered mm -hmm. mental prayer in the past. I Maybe just didn't you know weren't it. intentionally doing it. I didn't it. know the steps. So what, what were you doing wrong before that this has changed? If this has revolutionized your prayer life, then you must have been praying a year ago, obviously. So what, what weren't you doing? So the beautiful thing about the rosary is that a bad rosary is still a rosary. Because the ingredients are so powerful, even with dryness, even with distraction, just saying our Father who art in heaven, saying the Hail Marys over and over again, calling upon the Virgin yeah. Mary, the Holy Spirit, even if you're so depressed because you lost every member of your family and you prayed the rosary, you will be a little bit more light after the rosary than you were before, even if you couldn't focus whatsoever because the ingredients are so powerful. And so... I would, I would slip in and out of mental prayer not mm -hmm, knowing it mm -hmm. because I was steadfast on step number one, the practice of the presence of God. But there was so often where I didn't have a sense of God's presence and I, I didn't know what to do next. Whereas now I know when I don't feel the presence of God, I just need to go to the gospels and I need to imagine Christ speaking to me yeah, as yeah. a character or imagine the scenario. It's changed so much. Now, I think a response some people might have Please. is, 
I'm afraid that this is weird. Like, yes, I agree with you. I yeah. should use my, you know, the Lord works right. for our imagination. I get all that. Sure. But I've also encountered people who say things to me like God told me. Right. And I'm pretty sure God didn't tell them exactly. that. Even if what they're saying isn't objectively wrong, right. they seem like weird people. I don't want to be a weird person. Right. Therefore, it's probably just a lot safer if I stick to what the church has encouraged or mandated and I don't right. get too involved with this right. imagination stuff. Right. You, can, so, you can appreciate the, the I pushback. A hundred percent. And so that's that's where I was at. Because I don't like, and I get turned off. Like every woman at my church is like a mystic, and Jesus told me this, and Mary told me this, and I'm having right. visions of this, yeah. and they, they told me this for you, Gabe. And I'm like, you know, God's very capable of talking to me directly. He doesn't need you to tell me. So, good rule of thumb: if somebody says God told me to tell you, I automatically am like, you can tell me, but I'm not going to listen until the Lord speaks to me when I go to pray all the times that I'm praying. Mm. Um, but it was the doctors of the church that really convinced me, especially Teresa of Avila, the doctor of prayer. St. Alphonsus is a doctor of moral theology. St. Francis de Sales, the, the universal doctor. St. John of the Cross is the doctor of mysticism. Their, their testimony about how important it was, I was just like, okay. And then, again, I, it sounds like I'm a big Fatima guy, and to a degree, I am. But I don't like go around thinking about Fatima like some people. Um, when Our Lady told about the first Saturdays, she said, spend 15 minutes with me meditating upon the life of Christ. Mm. And I never understood what that meant. I was like, we just did the rosary and you want to spend 15 more minutes doing that without Hail Marys? I was very confused. But then when I understood mental prayer, like what the, the definitions were, I was like, oh, she wants me to be in the gospels and have her kind of just sit next to me with her arm around me. Mm. Um, and that changed things. So. You no, know, again, this is something that I encourage. I cannot enforce it on anybody, but for me, it's been extraordinarily fruitful. And you can look at at least my ministry and within the past year of learning mental prayer, for me personally, on a spiritual level, things have exploded. Um, and I feel like in prayer that Mary's saying, promote the rosary, yes, but you must promote the rosary where people encounter my son and me in the gospels so that they will bear more fruit mm -hmm, than beautiful. just saying the Hail Mary over and over, which is very fruitful. It's, it's a great prayer, but encountering Christ is our goal. Tell me about how your video with Tammy and Jordan Peterson came about and glory to Jesus yes. Christ for that video. I believe that's going to bring <laughs> it's, many It's already gotten people 3 million views. My goodness. Glory to God. And you understand so I'm well just done. a youth minister from Sugarland, Texas. <laughs> you understand that, right? Well, yeah, but you're also a very talented videographer, obviously. True. Thanks to YouTube and yes. everything well, else. I, I, so... It, Quick history, just so that people know that I'm not just some random youth, youth minister. In order to make my YouTube videos better, I would charge equipment that I couldn't afford. Maybe you're not supposed to do that, but Mother Angelica did it, so I did it. <laughs> and right. sometimes God would provide, and other times he wouldn't, and he would make me get to work. And so I would have to sell my video production services yeah. to pay for the equipment that I bought and also to help pay the bills because I am a youth minister making a youth minister's salary. Yeah. And one day I was working on a production it was very well production with the owner of Beck's Prime, which is a famous restaurant in Texas. And I was filming and I had a guy holding the lights and I had a guy holding the, the sunshade. And I felt like Our Lady was saying to me, look what you're willing to do for money. And I said, excuse me? Like this is interior, this is deep movement of the soul. It's not like I saw her face. She said, look what you're willing to do for a dollar and you're not willing to do for me. And I said, oh, I see what you want. She's like, I want you to quit making video productions to pay the bills mm. and trust me that I'm going to take care of you. Okay. So that's when things started getting more professional because I was, I was no longer dividing my time between making videos for the business world and myself. So I do have a little bit of a history with it. Yep. So I recently got back from um, a, a pilgrimage to Fatima in Spain and Portugal. I, I'm sorry, Portugal, Spain, and France. Mm -hmm. This was about, I got back uh, October 5th. And when I came back, I was working on a documentary on St. Maximilian Kolbe. Mm. And so we have his relic in a shrine in my church that I received from mm. Poland, from his monastery. What long, is it? Part of his clothing? It, it, it's, his, it's his hair. It's his beard. Excellent. Wow. So there's so many stories. Wow. But I was praying with him for this documentary. We also, next to him, have a shrine to St. Jose Maria. Okay. Escriva. Yeah. And I never prayed to that guy, never talked to him once. I would walk right past his shrine, right past his statue. I worked at that church <laughs> for well over 10 years. Mm -hmm. That was in 2009 that I got at St. Teresa's and I walked past his shrine for, it's 2024, 2023 when I, this happened. So I was coming back from my Maximilian Colby visit that I was making, asking him in mental prayer, 
Maximilian, I believe you're present. Guide me in making your video. I was walking back and I looked at the shrine of St. Jose Maria and I felt like he rebuked me. He said, you're so rude. That sounds like something he would do, he, given he would. what I know from his yeah, writings. <laughs> I didn't know anything about him yeah. until I studied him. He said, okay. you're so rude. And I said, excuse me? He's like, you believe Maximilian Kolbe is there and that's why you pray to him on a regular basis. And if that same theology that my relics are here, a part of me is here, and you don't stop, you don't say hello, you don't offer a prayer, you do nothing. And I said, excuse me? And then so I went and I knelt down in front of his shrine, his relics, his statue. Mm. And I was like, I'm open. I, using the methods of mental prayer, I'm a member of the body of Christ. You're a member of the body of Christ. Lord, let me talk to St. Jose Maria. So he started moving things in my heart and he was very strong with me. He, he rebuked me first for not doing a good enough job to protect those who've been entrusted to me. Just personal things, little things that I had let slip up just over time that were not on my radar at all. And that he like convicted me hard. And I was like, okay, I'm listening. He's like, your life is about to change. And I said, tell me. He said, well, after you finish this Maximilian Colby documentary on a spiritual level, you're going to reach many more souls. And I said, okay, whatever. Like in one ear, out the other. Like this other thing where you convicted me, I felt that in the depths of my heart. Yeah. This, there, whatever. So whenever you hear things like this, whatever. Like I, I don't care. Whatever. I don't know if this is true or not, or I'm making this up. Yeah. Like I, I feel nothing in here. So I go back to my office. I've got so many stories. I go back to my office and my assistant says, Gabe, you're not going to believe this. I said, what? I just got an email from Father Jose Maria of the Franciscan Friars of the Immaculate. And I said, yes. He said, you have to check this email. They want you to do a documentary. Uh, they want you to interview Tammy and Jordan Peterson. It, the Petersons are both gonna be there in Toronto in November. You have to tell them yes or no, like immediately. So I reached out to Father Jose Maria. I was like, can you give me some more details? And he said, and he's a very Marian guy. And he said, so this opportunity to film Tammy Peterson's testimony came up to him. I don't know if you know the Franciscans of the Immaculate. They have their own YouTube channel. They're dedicated to the media. They're dedicated to Maximilian Colby. This is their project. Father Jose Maria said, the past three nights I have not slept. Excuse me? Yeah, can you elaborate? Well, in prayer, the first night, the Virgin Mary told me, this is for Gabriel Castillo to do. This is for God be after hours. And I resisted her. And I didn't sleep that entire night. And the second night, I resisted her. And the third night, I finally said, fine, blessed mother, whatever you want. If you want it for Gabi, I'll give it to him. And so I said, sign me up. But I, was, I discerned everything very carefully and I did not have a strong, like I didn't know the Petersons, I didn't know their story. I was, I was just kind of like, I know they're famous. I know Jordan's a very famous Canadian. So I was like, is this God's will? I don't know. I, I don't feel a personal attachment. Yeah, the Jose Maria, St. Jose Maria, the Father Jose Maria, that's a cool connection. But my assistant was like, are you crazy? She was like a big Jordan Peterson fan. She's like, are you crazy? You have to do this. I was like, mm. and then she was like, I want to go too. I was like, no, because I'm very, I'm very big on prudence. So I, I'm not traveling with you. Like you're a girl. Yeah. You, like I, my office is in the complete opposite side of the building mm. just so that nobody will be like, you spend, you know what I mean? I'm just yeah. like, I'm like, no. And then she's like, well, I talked to my spiritual director. I really feel like I should go. I was like, I haven't discerned it. I haven't prayed about it. We'll just tell them you're going to do this. Mm. I'm, I'm, I'm detached from and it. And you trusted that she'd do a good enough job? No. Um, I trust. I, <laughs> okay. I don't know. No, I don't know. No. She's, she's great. She, she edits my videos. She sees me setting up cameras. But to go to a foreign country, Canada, and take equipment and set up a lighting interview. Was like, she, would, do you think she would have done it if you had have actually landed on that? I'm not going, you go. We did land on that. This oh, is a so you did, this Oh, okay. This I'm this sorry. Is, I just assumed a, that you no, would no, go. I, I did go. This is a miraculous story, American. Matt. Come All on, right, bro. Keep going. <laughs> so, so I'm like, fine, you're going to do this documentary. Yeah. You're going to go. I talked to my wife about it. We were in agreement. Talked to some spiritual advisors. Yeah, let her go. Like, you don't need to be there. You've taught her. We, we went through the scenario. Okay, you set up the main light here, 45 degree angle. Okay. You have another camera light here. You have this, this, and this. The Franciscans of the Immaculate, they do video production. Ah, that can help they'll, her. they'll yeah. be there. They'll give you some guidance. All you have to do is do the interview. And let's be honest, I'm difficult to deal with. I'm so strong-minded. It's very possible that Jordan and I can like not hit it off because of something that I say, my beliefs, and he's like, I'm out. I'm not doing this documentary so several weeks pass fry so our interviews on monday november the 5th the friday night the friday before my wife sends me a text she says i think you really need to go to this jordan peterson interview i was like yeah but there's no way 
I, I like I'm not going to travel with her. Like I'm just not doing that. Like it's not prudent. They said, well, I just we just got an email that Bishop Lopes, the Bishop of the Ordinary of the Chair of St. Peter, that's mm-hmm. where my son goes to school, said Beautiful. that they canceled school on Monday. Why? Well, because the the headmaster there, the principal there, she got her PhD, and so to celebrate her getting her PhD, he canceled school for Monday. And I was like, all right, looks like I'm going to Toronto. So I bought my tickets immediately. I don't have a lot of money. So I used all the money that I had. I, I, I charged it um, to get the tickets for my son and I to go to interview the Petersons. So I'm at the store on Saturday. We're leaving in two days. I tell the Blessed Mother, I'm like, Blessed Mother, if I'm going to be honest with you, because we only have 30 minutes to do the B-roll. We have an interview with Tammy, then an interview with Jordan at 10 o'clock. This is going to happen at a university, a, a, a girl's college, I'm sorry. Um I need another camera. Like I have three cameras. They're great to get all the angles, but I need to have two cameras on my body, wide angle, close up shots. Uh, I need it. If you want, if you want this to be successful, I need the money. I get a text message literally as I utter the prayer from a a woman that I went on pilgrimage with saying, Gabe, if you ever need any money, feel free to ask me (laughs) while you're praying, while I'm praying. I have text message screenshots. I don't know if they're still on my phone, but, and then, so I say, actually, I need $2,300 for a new camera. She's like, fine, I'll put it in the mail on Monday. It's like, I need it. Like it's 11 AM. The camera store closes at five today. Can you please have this to me? Like, can you PayPal this to me? And she's like, done. I had the the camera that I needed within two hours. After that, we go, we fly to Canada, my son and I, I'm a bold guy. I've got a lot of vices. One of them is Cholericness. So we're we're driving through the streets of Toronto. I'm blaring. I'm proud to be an American. Where at least I know I'm free. So I'm being myself. We go. We set up. The woman who facilitated the conversion of Tammy. Her name is Queenie. Wonderful woman. Mm. I didn't know this. Opus Day numerary. We're filming in an Opus Day center. <laughs> Are you connecting the dots? Saint yes. Jose Maria is the mm. one who told me at this shrine. The priest, Father Jose Maria, is the one who made the connection. And now I'm filming in an Opus Dei Center. Mm. I don't know the story yet. And she's like, so tell me about your videography business and career. I was like, well. Who's asking you this? Oh, the Queenie. Queenie, Queenie, yeah. 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 And so like I made her jaw drop. I was like, I'm a youth minister from Sugarland, Texas. And then she's like looking at the Franciscans like, what are you doing? Why did you bring this goon? (laughs) She hadn't seen any of your work prior to this. She kind of saw it, but like, why is this, like, honestly, this is a big breaking story. Yeah. Like, why not give this to the Daily Wire, Michael yeah. Knowles? Why not yeah. Pints with Aquinas? Why not EWTN, Bishop Barron? He did a great job with Shia LaBeouf, yeah. whatever. Like, what are we doing? Like, d- Jordan's not going to be okay with this. And then so she was a little spooked. I, I could tell. But I, I was relishing in that. I was like, here we are, baby. You gotta make this. we're gonna do this. <laughs> and so I didn't hear the testimonial. That night, something sp- spooks Jordan. So he sends an email to Queenie at like eleven PM at night saying, I'm not doing the interview. And I was like, Oh gosh. Did he did he say why? He or? didn't say why. I imagine why. I, I can I I'll speculate. Yeah. I don't know. I'm not I don't know. Sure. Jordan, if you're watching this, please forgive me. I would imagine that this sounds all very odd. Like this is, a, he, he said yes, because he wants to support his wife. He loves, that man loves his wife. He talks about his wife, he, tears will come out of his eyes. He loves her so much. He's very devoted to her, very noble and honorable. But I know Catholics and I know Catholics who have been writing letters to Jordan, asking him to convert mm. um, constantly. Like I can't imagine, like I've had friends who said, I went to the Jordan Peterson thing. I gave him a rosary. I went That's to Jordan Peterson. It's going to be Peterson. brutal. You know what I mean? It's going to be brutal to have different religions vying for your allegiance. Right. Like that. And, and especially, kind of treating you just like we need a big man on our side. Right. Yeah. yeah so what is that like? I imagine that, honestly, uh, that that was, I don't know. I, I'm not, I can't read his soul. But that's what I felt. Like, yeah. if I do this, uh, if I do this video, n- I'm not going to get stopped, bugged about this. And so he said no. And then so. Now, did he say no, he's not coming or no, Tammy's not coming? He's not coming. Tammy's all in. Oh, yeah. Tammy loves Queenie. There, and, and Jordan loves Queenie. But this is her testimony. Like, I don't really need to do it. But. Queenie made a big deal. I'm really sorry if this is not like for public knowledge, but it happened. So this is the truth. So Queenie made a big deal. Hey, we, we have a book signing at this college. People are showing up. You need to at least show up for the book signing. Sure, I'm going to show up for the book signing. I message my friend, Father Jose Maria. Yeah. I say, Father, you need to pray. You need to pray because this is not going well. Like there's, we were getting some interference. It's not going to happen. He emails me back so confident. Father Jose Maria... 
of the Franciscans of the Immaculate. Seriously, mm-hmm. I love that guy. His confidence was like, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? This was organized by the mother of God. <laughs> Do you think that, that, that he's going to get in the way hey. of reaching so many millions of souls? I was like, are you kidding me, Gabe? Don't even worry about it. And so the next morning, we still don't know if Jordan's going to film. Um, Tammy gives her testimonial. We film it perfectly. It was good that I went. It was good that I went because the lighting was a little off. They had some blue lights in the background. Not ideal. Like for, uh, like uh, it's a very cozy shot that I, I designed. Yeah. It looks like you're at their, their house. That was at the, in the, like the bottom floor of the Opus Dei Center, this girl's college. Uh, my assistant did the interview because again, she's far more enjoyable to talk to than I am. Okay. Um, so Tammy does her interview. Jordan at this point is not doing it. He's not going to do the interview. He's not doing it. Is he there? Uh, he, he hadn't shown up yet. He was just going to show up for the book signing, go straight to it. The Franciscans are like, hey, should we cancel this? Should we just go ahead and tear everything down so you can go film the B-roll? I was like, no. Like Father Jose Maria was in my soul talking okay. to me saying, so I said, no, set up the interview just as if Jordan's going to do it. Mm. So we set up the interview. We got the lighting perfectly. Next, my, I'm, I don't know what's happening. My, I, so this is just coming from my son. So my son was with Queenie and Jordan, I think, I don't know for a fact, Jordan went down the wrong hallway where he shouldn't have been. Queenie is overcome by the power of the Holy Spirit and says, you're doing the interview. <laughs> I, I don't know if she meant it as a question. <laughs> but it didn't sound but like it, one. It came off like very strong. And then so all I hear is, well, looks like I'm doing this interview. What are we talking about, guys? And then my assistant's like, oh, we just want to talk to you about your wife, your perspective on it. Um, and it was great. And I got a lot of spiritual warfare when I was editing it. So when I was editing it, the shots would come in and out of focus. The lighting would, mm. would change. Uh, it would lose the footage. But when you're a child of Mary, this is one of the benefits. When you're a child of Mary, the devil is on a leash. As long as you remain close to Mary, if there's any diabolical attacks, it is only so that she can crush his, serp- crush his serpent head and further humiliate him. So the editing that I did, the first three or four minutes, I knew exactly what to put in the video because those were the exact parts that the devil kept dropping. Mm. Like we would come in and out of focus and the colors and the, re- the red lines would happen. It was like dropped media. I was like, oh, look, this, this happens to be the juiciest parts. Let's lead with, oh, she's got 10 minutes. She's got 10 months to live. And then let's lead with his heart breaking that his beautiful wife is, you know, going to die. And how are yeah. you going to? So I knew what to put in because mm. our lady let, let the monkey off the leash just for a little bit. Wonderful. Yeah. So what ah, was- This is even better. I forgot to mention this. So- when Tammy was healed, it was on the fifth day of a novena to which saint? Jose Maria. Saint Jose Maria. <laughs> Kidding. God yeah. is good, my friend. Wow. The saints are alive. The saints speak to us. Amen. All right. So you'd edited the video. You're about to upload it, knowing this is gonna this is gonna cause a stir. Like, yeah. What was that like? Uh, so I had recently botched Saint Maximilian Kolbe. Okay. So the, the, the documentary you were. Yeah. So I had. Because of my own pride, because of my own lack of discernment, I made an editing mistake and I was so eager to get it out that I uploaded it and then I had to delete it immediately after Mm -hmm. because the images didn't fill the full frame because I made it cinematic aspect ratio and not all of the images transferred. Okay. And so it was on par to be up with 500,000, 600,000 views. And and I'm still sorry to this very day that, and then so I, I deleted it. And then it had been up for like three hours. And so all the normal viewers, all the normal subscribers that YouTube uses to check to see if this is good or not had already seen it or they clicked on it for two seconds and it didn't get the views that it deserved. Okay. And so I had a major like stored in my heart from that. And even when I arrived in Toronto, the head or the, the one who was in charge of the Franciscans of the Immaculate were like, great video on Maximilian Colby. Too bad I heard you botched it and you did not, because of you, thousands of souls didn't get it. Sorry, and what? I, who was saying this? Just, just, a, just a priest. It was true. I botched it. And so he was just questioning my judgment, which is true. I did. I made a mistake. I failed. I I, I, I made a big mistake and I learned from it. But he's accusing you like that? No, it's not. A, well, it wasn't accusing. It was just asking if I'm... If I, it was just questioning. Okay. It, it was the will of God. I needed it. I, I needed it. 
I needed to be put in my place. Okay. Um, he did the right thing. And it helped me making this, the documentary for Jordan and Tammy, um, because people will see the Maximilian Colby documentary who need to see it. Mm -hmm. um, and I didn't, I didn't watch this one, thanks be to God. But yeah. it was because I finally said, blessed mother, you're in charge, <laughs> please get, and I had so, so humility is distrust of self, great confidence in God. So I had so much distrust of myself and my confidence in God was extraordinary. Yeah. Before I forget Thursday, let's put a link to that video below yeah. for this, for Tammy Peterson thing, because I want more and more people to see it. And let me tell you something that's, <laughs> okay. so something that there's a lot of signal graces that came along with this. So I mentioned that I was praying at St. Maximilian Colby Shrine, and then I went to St. Jose Maria. And the video, the documentary that I made was St. Maximilian Colby. The very next one was Jose Maria. Yeah. The birthday of St. Maximilian Colby is January 8th. The birthday of St. Ma uh, St. Jose Maria is January 9th. Hmm. So it's just funny how like all these patterns, yeah. the saints are so alive. What feedback have you got from that video? Uh, the most important feedback I got was from Jordan Peterson. What did he say? He said, excellent, excellent editing. Seriously, top notch. And on and I got a feeling he's not the kind of man who would say that if he didn't mean it. He really meant it. And that meant a lot to me. <laughs> it was, you did an excellent job. The, the really day did. of the filming, I, I could tell I was, he, again, this is, he's opening himself up to everybody asking, your wife is becoming Catholic. Yeah. When are you going to become Catholic? Right. So I, I, I don't know, but I got the impression that he wasn't going to do this again. Yeah. But then when we turned it around and it was amazing, it was, it was the hand of God who edited it and produced it. Um, I think that that was a big deal for him that Catholics aren't just gonna, cause I could have, you know, I could have exploited, I could have taken him sure, out of context. Yeah. I could have made him sound more Catholic than he was. Right, right. And I gave him a fair, I told the story, the parts where he was a doubter, I made it clear. He's like, well, you know, medically yeah. this could have happened. Yeah. I just can't explain how it happened the day that my wife prophesied, which happened to be our 30th wedding anniversary. Right. That I just can't explain. Right. So I gave the pauses. Yeah, good I was, for you for doing that. Yeah. It was, I, I just, I didn't, you know, my soul is on the line, so I, I had to take yeah. it very carefully and I already botched something previously, so. Oh, praise the Lord, man. But we've, we've had, can I tell you one more miracle story? Yeah. It's incredible. Always, so, always more miracle stories, yeah. So we were doing a documentary on St. Maria Goretti. Yep. Lord, help me to tell this well. Uh, my assistant went to, so first of all, Father Carlos Martins, a good yeah, friend of mine. I know him. He came to Houston to talk about spiritual warfare, to spread his uh, testimony, uh, Podcast, The Exorcist Files, excellent podcast, very mm -hmm. spiritually nourishing. Good. So he came to town and he asked, hey, Gabe, he gave the talk for free at my parish. Mm -hmm. And he said, Gabe, do you mind filming my relics talk? I said, sure, Father. Of course, I would love to film your relics talk. I felt like, hey, this guy's doing me a favor, coming to speak. My, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to upload this talk to YouTube, get hundreds of thousands of views. I'll do this filming for you for free. Afterwards, he made a donation to me for like $2,000. And I asked, hey, can I pull the part of your talk about Maria Gretti and make a documentary about it? Mm. And the $2,000 donation that you gave me is exactly what I would need to pay for my assistant to go to Italy and film at Maria Gretti's house. All that happens. She, she comes back into town. Uh, she gives me the footage. I have Father Carlos. I have the uh, footage she filmed in Italy, in Natuno. I'm editing it. For some reason, the footage goes red. Diabolical attacks. I don't know what it is. It works on her computer. It's not working on my computer. I have a very, very, very high-end computer. So I say, all right, I'm going to go edit this in the church. I go to the church. Everything's working fine. And then Father Carlos goes on this long explanation of how Maria Gretti's first miracle was a young man whose foot was crushed and they were going to have to cut it off. And then, he, so I'm like, I don't have... I don't have five minutes of footage of broken foot. This is not good. And then he goes to the next mm. part where he says, and then a young man just recently, he had a broken foot. And I said, why don't you pray to Maria Goretti? Da, 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 da. And he was miraculously healed. I'm like, again, now I've got 10 minutes of no footage of a kid. What am I? I'm, I'm venting the same frustration that you're experiencing now to the Lord and the blessed sacrament. Lord, what the heck? Like, what am I supposed to, I don't even know what it looks like. I can't wrap my son's foot up. So he's like, you're done. This is all interior again. You're done. Go inside. You're done. Don't talk to me that way. So I'm like, I'm sorry. Please forgive me. He's like, you're done for today. I'm walking to my office and I'm going to change the name of this individual. I'm walking to my office and my pastor is talking to my assistant. You need to pray for Kevin. 
And I was like, what happened? I, she, this is not my conversation. I said, what happened to yeah, Kevin? Yeah, yeah. Last night he was working and a crane fell and broke his foot and they're gonna have to cut it off. And I said, that's great. That's fantastic. <laughs> He's like, what? I was like, I was just, I was just editing a video <laughs> and I need a foot that's about to be amputated. Oh my. And he's like, what? He's like, N no, yeah. no, yeah. You your are explanation not. doesn't make this better, Gabe. <laughs> and it's, it's a long story, but yeah. I had just received a first class relic of St. Maria Grady in the mail. I know this is a lot of, inf I know, I know. No, are you kidding? This is what long form discussions are for. I know, Don't leave out a detail, oh man. Gosh. Go. It's, it's, it's really going to open up a can of worms. Okay. okay. So, oh my gosh, bless him, mother, have mercy on me, poor sinner. So I was doing a silent retreat at a passionist retreat center mm -hmm. in like 2021. I know. And I had an overwhelming sense that I needed a relic of St. Gabriel of Our Lady of Sorrows. I don't know why. I don't know how. It just overwhelmed. I don't know anything about him other than my name's Gabriel and his name is Gabriel. Yep. Overwhelming sense. I needed his relic. So I go home. I message Father Carlos Martins. I send him a couple relics that are on eBay. Do not do this. Leave this poor man alone, please. <laughs> Out of obedience, if you're getting anything from the story, do not bug him about if relics are real or not real. He does not want to hear it. He didn't want to hear it from me. E either way, he said, yes, this relic is real. And I said, is it a sin to buy it? He said, no, it, it, I, I discourage it, but it's real. And if you wanted to buy it, it's all you. And I said, I, I promise I'll never ask about this ever again. <laughs> I was about to buy it. And the spirit of the Lord spoke to me and said, don't buy it. Wait until Monday. This is a Friday. Wait until Monday. And I said, okay. So on Monday, I'm going to my parish office and a gentleman named Wayne, whom I love, Wayne and Chava Buse. Gabriel, I came to see you. I said, oh, tell me. He said, I got you a prayer card of St. Gabriel of Our Lady of Sorrows. And I was like, cool. I was going to buy his relic. And he said to wait till Monday. But this is just a prayer card. It's not a relic. Great. I recognize the hand of God. At least I'm not nuts. Yeah. And I might be a little bit nuts. So I took a picture of the prayer card. This is June 21st, okay. 2021. I remember the exact day. I took a picture of it and I put it on Facebook. I said, such a coincidence, just thinking about him. Five minutes later, I get a text message from a priest, Father Kennedy from Alexandria, Louisiana. He says, I saw your post on Facebook. I have access to a first class relic of St. Gabriel of Our Lady of Sorrows and St. Gemma Galgani. Can I give them to you? I feel like it's God's will that I give you this relic. Of course. Pause. Now we're going back in time to my St. Maria Goretti documentary. Yeah, yeah. I'm buying a prayer card of St. Gabriel of Our Lady of Sorrows on eBay. Yeah. In the sidebar is a picture of a relic that looks exactly like my St. Gabriel one from the Passionist Monastery from Rome that I know is real. And I see it says Maria Goretti, but it looks exactly like my St. Gabriel one. So I'm like, why would Maria Goretti, she's not a passionist. I didn't know that she went to a passionist parish. And so the passionist claimed her as her own. Okay. And so I forwarded that picture to that priest. And I said, Father, I hate to bother you. I know this is not normal. Why does this look exactly like my other one? He's like, oh, there's no shadow of a doubt. Like, I can't tell you 100%. Like, don't venerate this in a church um, because you're getting it on eBay. So there is like a 0.0001% chance that this relic is not real. But I would, I have a moral certitude that that's a relic of Maria Goretti. And it was under the price of like 200 bucks. Mm. So I, I ordered it um, and it arrived the day before I found out about this poor kid's foot getting going to get amputated. Yeah. So I'm trying to convince my pastor. I was like, father, I'm making a documentary about Maria Goretti. She healed a man. <laughs> You're trying to explain was to broken. him in five minutes what you've just taken this long to yeah. explain to me. Yeah. <laughs> foot was broken. Yeah. It was very bad. It was well, very ugly. He was not happy. <laughs> and he's a very calm, yeah. discerning individual. And I have a relic of hers that just came in the mail. Can I, can I, can you just tell me what hospital, can you give me the name or the email of the dad or the mom and I can contact it? He's like, absolutely not. You are the youth minister, minister, not exploit -er. You're not going to exploit this young man's foot so that you can make a YouTube video. Mm -hmm. I was like, but father, this is perfect. I got the relic yesterday and I just was like editing this and I didn't have the footage. This is God's will. <laughs> He's like, no, absolutely not. Mm -hmm. So I go back to the church. I'm like, clearly this is your will, Lord. Clearly <laughs> this is your will. And he's like, it is my will. I was like, go back and talk to your pastor. And I said, fine. At the same time, you have to understand, this is not normal. 
you, you grasp this? This is not normal. Well, so sometimes as a sign, I ask for little signs from Our Lady. Can you give me some confirmation, just that external signals of things that are going on in my heart, that I'm not insane, that what you say to me in prayer is real. Like, I don't need it, but this is not normal. So I asked her for seven lions. What does that mean? I have no idea what the heck that means, dude. I was like, give me seven lines. I don't, what is that, toys? Is that stickers? What, what do you want? I, have, I just said it, okay? Okay. I just said it. Without really thinking about it. You have seven lines. I can assure you, I was not thinking. Okay. <laughs> I was thinking about one thing. I was, I was thinking about one thing. Get to that hospital. I need yeah. this footage. Okay. This, this is like the Friday before the Feast of Maria Goretti, which is the next week. And I want this documentary out by her feast day because that's prime time to get people to share videos. So I go to my pastor. He's having a meeting with somebody, a friend of mine, who's very devoted to Maria Goretti. So I, I interrupt the meeting because I took that as a providential sign. I was like, hey, I know you're having a conversation. You're going to love this story. Father, uh, <laughs> so can you please, I promise you, I will not film him. I, I will not film him. Can I just go and pray with him, Father? Just want to pray with him. Just offer some support because he's a young man mm -hmm. and he's probably questioning God's timing of all of this. And he's a track star. He's an amazing track star. One of the best track athletes ever. So he said, fine, I'll give you the dad's contact info and you can, you guys work this out. Don't exploit this young man. I said, I, I, I don't want to. I only want the will of God. <laughs> So I take my relic of St. Gabriel of Our Lady of Sorrows. I take my newly relic of St. Maria Goretti and I'm driving to the Texas Medical Center and I'm praying. I was like, what, what, how do you, how, what is the process? Lord, I, I have never prayed with somebody who is actually like traumatized and who might be emotionally vulnerable. Mm. Uh, what is the, like, I don't want to put you on the spot because I think you want to heal this child. Um, what should I do? And so he said, in prayer again, um, this is my discernment. Go over there, you know, tell him the story of Maria Gretti. Tell him that there's no guarantee that the ordinary means is to let nature take its course. But sometimes God can break the laws of nature if, but not, that's not the norm. And we should, that doesn't mean that God doesn't love us, etc. Yeah. And then I felt like he was saying, and then pray a rosary and thanksgiving for the grace that he wasn't killed, that he has a family that loves him, that he has the Catholic faith. And I was like, we'll put a pin on that one because I will just see how this goes. Right. Yeah. So I get out. I don't even know where the hospital room is. Like I've never been to the medical center. So I get out of the car. I'm holding two relics going through the lobby of some garage. I just see the first nurse I see and I get in the elevator with her and she, I didn't tell her what floor I was going to go to. She automatically hits floor seven. And then I'm like, well, that was weird. We're going to the seventh floor. All right. So we're going up this elevator. I exit the elevator and I see, oh, we're not in the hospital. We are still in the parking garage. But I did ask for seven lions and this kid is going to be on the seventh floor. And this nurse took me to the seventh floor. So my spidey sense is on spiritual okay. heightened alert, right? Uh -huh. So we go in and I come back out. I'm like, all right, I got to text the dad. Where are we? He's like, we're in the seraphim wing of this medical building, et cetera. We're in the seventh floor. Come over here. So I go in and the boy is so overwhelmed with the power of the Holy Spirit. He looks at me and he says, Gabe, this was, this was not an accident. When it was happening, it was happening as if it was slow motion. And I knew the hand of God was involved in this. Mm. He's like, I am not sad. I am not in desolation. He was so confident. And I explained to him, I was like, look, exactly as I rehearsed in the car, I'm going to put the prayer card in your cast. Like, and the, the doctors thought that worst case scenario, we're cutting your foot off. Uh, best case scenario, one day, maybe you can walk. We're going to do a, we're going to put a lot of pins and a lot of plates and a lot of everything in here. Hopefully you can walk. I wouldn't count on running ever again. All right. So I, we do the prayer. I, I give him the relic. He puts the relic to his head. Uh, part of the prayer is forgiving everybody, including yourself for all, anybody who's ever hurt you, forgive yourself as well. Mm. Uh, afterwards, he, he's overwhelmed with peace. And he says, Gabe, can we pray the rosary? And I said, excuse me? He's like, I just want to pray in Thanksgiving mm -hmm. that my life wasn't lost and that I've got a father and a brother and a mother and all these siblings who absolutely love God. And I'm just so thankful we pray a rosary, I was like, oh my gosh, this is crazy. So we kneel down, we pray the rosary. And afterwards, like I'm, this is probably one of the most powerful spiritual moments of my life and nothing has happened. I'm like, 
Like I'm just overwhelmed by this kid's faith. Yeah. Um, and he's like, after we're done, he's like, thanks so much for praying with me. It meant so much that you came up to visit me. And I was like, dude, you're the lion. You're a lion. Like you've got the heart of a lion. You're a fighter. You've got God with you. And he's like, I am. I was like, no, no. I, I, I mean, like you're a lion. Like you're, he's like, no, no, I am. I am literally the lion. I am the mascot for my school. I am <laughs> <laughs> like, I wear the, the lion head and I run what? through the thing at football games. And I was like, wow. And I was like, can I, I, I know this is kind of absurd. I'm making this documentary. Can, <laughs> I, film, the thing. can I film your foot? It's like, absolutely. For the glory of God. I want God to be glorified through all of this. And so I film him. So in that documentary of St. Maria Goretti, there is about five or six minutes of footage in a real hospital with a kid whose foot was really crushed by a crane who was supposed to have it amputated. Mm. I left. I did not reach out to the, I, I reached out to the, fam, the family one time after that because I don't know. I don't know where they're at spiritually. So mm. I was just reached out to the dad. I was like, how, how are things going? fine, you know, he's in pain, he's at home, he's suffering, uh, he's questioning things, which is normal. I was like, I'm going to leave it alone. Because here you are in a documentary about two people whose feet were healed by St. Maria Goretti. Yeah. It, I didn't want to mess with it. I was just like, I, all of this was in the providence of God. There are no accidents. There's no accidents. I don't know. And then a week later, I see the mom and I say, how's my boy doing? And she just starts bawling. And she's like, so-and-so didn't reach out to you, her husband. I was like, no, I haven't heard from him. And she just gives me the biggest hug. She said, the doctor said that you're either the most lucky young man who has ever lived, or you've been blessed by God. You don't need any surgery. You don't need any amputation. In three to four months, you'll be walking again. And to this day, this happened literally last July. The Feast of Maria Grady is July 6th. Hmm. Literally last year, he's now running cross country without a problem. Wow. Because the saints are alive. That is incredible. Insanity, dude. Insanity. I just love it. I love that you were like, all right, I'll, I'll, I'll take this. You're the heart of a lion. Seven lions, seven four. Sure, we're stretching it a bit, but that's okay. Yeah. No, literally, I'm a lion. Yeah, and it's funny because there's seven members of their family, and their family is so faithful. Wow. They truly are. do have the heart of a lion when it I comes to I can't wait faith. to watch this documentary. St. Marie Goretti documentary, 600,000 views. It's really good. Praise it's really God. Good. So what have you got in the hopper? What's the next thing um, that you're Padre working on? A lot. So in prayer... Uh, stories are really important. It's coming up to me that stories are really important. Maximilian Colby knew this. So I, I personally believe Maximilian Colby, he did. He knew he was going to be a martyr. His theology is revolutionary. John Paul II called him the prophet of the new millennium. Mm -hmm. um, so I personally believe that at Auschwitz, when the guard said, mm -hmm. okay, I'm selecting 10, Maximilian Colby was looking for the opportunity to give his life for the mother of God because one, to fulfill prophecy. But other than that, the Mariology that he's made famous mm. would not exist. He would just been some kooky old Franciscan who loved the Virgin Mary too much. But because he said yes to the story of mm -hmm. his life, Our Lady was able to do beautiful things. So the goal is to continue to make beautiful stories about the lives of the saints, to highlight people's stories who live ordinary lives and some who live her heroic lives or famous lives like the Petersons, like some of the testimonials we have, God willing, we discussed. Hopefully I can share your life, um, your conversion, your story, your hopes, your dreams um, on the podcast, I'm, I'm on the YouTube channel as well as your wife. So that also sharing parts of my own life because I don't share some of these stories, even though there's a story for every single video, just because it's spiritually dangerous for me, just because pride, I have literally have the word humility tattooed on my hand mm. because I don't want to go to hell. Um, and I might still go, but at least I'll go begging the mother of God to give me the grace of humility. Um, so sharing that story, but really just sharing, sharing our lady and the story. I, I really believe that every saint who's ever lived, their life is a story. And humans are naturally drawn to stories. One of the reasons your podcast is so pop, besides the great work you do, is that you're sharing the story of God in individuals and it resonates with people in different ways. Yeah. No matter who the person is on, there's always somebody who can say, I can relate to that guy. Yeah, yeah. I can it's relate funny, to that guy. earlier you said that you get some of these interviews in so that you can like, Yes. You know, yes. Tell people to pray the rosary. Yeah. And it's something something similar with what I do because I like having the bigger names on so that we can have the no name on yes. whose story is just, if not more powerful yes. than the big name. And people are blown away because people are so fascinating and the Lord 
is working in their life just as much as he is in the more popular people. That's what struck me when I told you about that quote from Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs, again, yeah. played an important role in my life. Because at the same time, I was looking at people on EWTN and on Steubenville conference stages and thinking they're special. They're doing yeah. what I can't do. Yeah, no. And then when Steve Jobs pointed it out, they're not, they just happen to be in the same place. Mm. You receive the same sacraments at the apostle. Steve Jobs didn't say that, but that's what was going, that's what the Holy Spirit was saying to me. Yeah. Like just because they're on a stage, just because they have a mic, just because they have a camera, doesn't mean that they're special. Yeah. Anybody, anybody, everybody's story is powerful. Well, and we have to, I think it's a sign maybe of pride too, to downplay the work that the Lord has for us. And this happened to me recently. I was invited Sorry. to Sydney to yes. speak. Yes. And what I noticed is the way I was explaining it left a lot to be desired. What are you doing? I'm going to Sydney to give some talks. I'm like, that's not what you're doing. You are going to Sydney to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ for I the salvation it. of souls. And I thought to myself, well, why would I downplay that? And then it's right. there's all this false humility. Yes. Well, because look at you. Have you met you? You're pathetic. Right. It's like, yeah, but what does that have to do with me? That's what I love. Proclaiming yeah. or not proclaiming the gospel. I am yes. going to proclaim the gospel. Yes. And I think just accepting that, yes. there's no pride in accepting what has been placed within you. Right. And you, and you can glory and say, I am a sinner. So the devil will whisper to us, you're not good enough. And sometimes you're like, you're right, I'm not good enough. Yeah, but so the, answer, the answer is, you're right, I'm not good enough. But thanks be to God, this is about Jesus and Mary because they are good enough. Yeah. Anybody can do anything as long as they're cooperating yeah. with the grace of God. Yeah, glory to Jesus Christ. This has been a pleasure. You're the best, man. I appreciate you. you having me on. Thanks for taking a chance. Oh, I wish we had done it sooner. Thank you for all the work that honor. you're doing. We have you links to your YouTube channel, your excellent videos below. Please go subscribe to Gabby. Why Gabby after hours? So my mom, again, remember I mentioned how she's Mexican. Yeah. So she calls me Gabriel. Well, you, you you mentioned that she might be Mexican. Or that she, she thinks, thinks she's Mexican. <laughs> she, go I don't, I'll honor her Mexican heritage. Yeah. So for short, she will call me Gabby. Uh -huh. So the short for Gabriel is Gabby. Yeah. It doesn't sound too masculine. Doesn't sound too strong. So my mom calls me Gabi and people who know me well and intimately will sometimes call me Gabi. Okay. When I was making my YouTube channel, I had had, I had th this is a big mistake that I made. I had three channels. I was, I was building three houses, which was very dumb. I did that early on. I had like a podcast channel. I had this channel. I had talks channel. Very stupid. I wish I could go back in time and say, build one house, have three rooms in your house. Yeah, okay. And so yeah. I was venturing into videos where I was speaking by saying, okay, after Lent, I'm going to, I mean, during Lent, I'm going to do two hours of adoration. And so it'll be like Gabi, his reflections that he got after two hours of adoration. And after I would do those two hours, I would come out and talk about stuff, some of it more relevant than others, but the only ones that did not give me hiccups in editing or in publishing were the ones about Mary. Mm. And then so very quickly, I was like, I see what you're doing. <laughs> You, the, the people of God don't need me. They need you. Okay. So the name just stuck, Gabby, okay. after hours. Fantastic. Thanks, man. Thank you, brother.